Thank you, Tony, and, and welcome everybody. Um, we, are, we are very happy to have uh, Sudarshan Kanan, assistant professor at Rutgers University. Um, and he will give us, he will give the keynote talk of the workshop. So, so very briefly, Sudarshan works on operating systems for large, large scale data center and mobile systems and, and the implications on computer architecture, distributed systems, high performance computing systems. More specifically, his team is building systems for efficiently managing memory and storage heterogeneity. And today, as our keynote talk, he will tell us about heterogeneous memory software management and challenges. So Sudarsan, uh, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you uh, all for attending the talk and thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to be in this uh, uh, workshop, which is very relevant to areas that we are working on. Uh, so today I'm going to present uh, uh, some of the heterogeneity mem heterogeneous memory management challenges. Uh, I'll also discuss a couple of our work at how we are trying to solve this problem, but I'll also discuss uh, other open challenges that we as a community must address. Uh, before going to the talk, uh, this is uh, not just my work, it's done with collaboration with a lot of my collaborators at Georgia Tech, Ale, uh, so my students at Rutgers, so uh, 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 thanks to all of them. All right, so this is going to be my high level structure of the talk. I'm just going to discuss uh, at the first uh, set of background uh, about uh, what type of memory heterogeneity that I'm talking about, given there's a huge variation across these technologies. Some of the challenges that uh, uh, we have worked on, uh, I'll discuss a couple of our uh, previous work uh, uh, about kernel level object placement and heterogeneous memory management for the virtualized system. I'll mostly focus on the first part and then I'll briefly discuss the future challenges and ongoing work. All right, for decades, our system, uh, uh, for, for at least for the last couple of decades, we have been getting used to multi-socket homogeneous memory system uh, where there were uh, multiple sockets, but the memory in general was homogeneous. Uh, we have come up with like uh, better interfaces for applications to utilize something like uh, NUMA capability better. But uh, recent with su substantial increase in data, there is a substantial need for like uh, uh, processing more and more and more data. So which means that the available memory capacity for applications has been reducing. So that has forced us to kind of like introduce more and more memory tiers. For example, uh, have faster memory tiers as well as Mem uh, storage uh, memory devices that can store a larger amount of data. So now with this increasing memory heterogeneity, a question revolves around how are we going to kind of manage these data across different storage devices? So in this talk, I'm just going to focus on a single system memory heterogeneity. Uh, so uh, it looks like we are moving to an era where there is going to be a combination of multi-socket homogeneous and heterogeneous memory systems that are going to be present in a single system and the challenge is managing this data across these tiers. So just to kind of briefly describe some of the promising technologies that are already there uh, versus some of the upcoming technologies. Uh, in terms of talking about memory heterogeneity, uh, these, uh, uh, unlike NUMA, these technologies significantly differ in terms of la uh, latency, bandwidth, and capacity characteristics. For example, if we take something like a high bandwidth memory, the bandwidth variation is somewhere between two to even eight X. In contrast, for example, technologies like non-volatile memory have significantly lower bandwidth and higher latency, but the capacity is significantly higher. Uh, also, there is a substantial amount of cost differences. For example, some of the high bandwidth memory technologies uh, in terms of dollars per GB could be even as four X or even eight X higher, in contrast to something like a non-volatile memory that really scale well in capacity. So at a high level, uh, it, uh, while all these technologies are going to, uh, or at least some parts of these technologies are going to, part of, uh, going to become a part of our system, one question is how do we manage these array of different technologies together? Now, there are some technologies in the real world that are upcoming uh, uh, technologies. For example, Samsung recently announced HBM2 Flareboard, which could provide like close to a terabyte system memory bandwidth, or at least like 256 GB per second and for eight channel. The capacity is around four to eight GB, uh, which, is, which is quite significantly lower even compared to the DRAM technologies that we have. 
uh, SK Hynix recently announced HBM3 with half a terabyte bandwidth, and uh, the expectation is that the capacity could be somewhere between 16 to 64 GB. In addition to these technologies, there are other uh, processing and memory technologies also that are coming. For example, Samsung's uh, process in memory technology, uh, UPMEM, which provides specific functionality inside the memory to not only store data, but also do the processing. In addition to that, there is a lot of innovation in terms of like faster interfaces. For example, uh, CXL uh, standards for CPU to fast device interconnect. So one thing is that uh, that is going to be a lot of different technologies. Uh, one question is how do we manage it? One approach is we can just kind of like forget the software stack and completely manage in the hardware. For example, one, uh, one example is the Intel's uh, NVM 3D X point, which when configured in the memory mode, uh, automatically converts the DRAM into an L4 cache and the hardware kind of takes care of moving the data between NVRAM and the DRAM. However, given there is a significant difference across these technologies, my personal belief is that it, it is insufficient that we just simply uh, delegate everything to the hardware. So the OS or the runtimes are going to play an important role in terms of where to place the data, how to place the data, and how to move the data around. So, uh, briefly to kind of discuss a different landscape of solutions for addressing this memory heterogeneity. Uh, in the past, there have been a lot of work on application level approaches where, uh, uh, because application knows better in terms of how they are using the data, or maybe even at the runtime or even something like JVM decides where to place the data. This is great, specifically if you are just one application running in the entire system and you know exactly how your application is using the data. But the problem is that still an application has a restricted view, which means that it doesn't have a holistic view of the entire system. There has been a lot of OS level approaches also. For example, the OS transparently manages data. More specifically, the OS is responsible for like identifying what is hot versus what is cold and moving the data around. Uh, more recently, this has expanded to uh, near and far memory technologies also. For example, a very recent work from Google uh, not only used OS, but also used machine learning approaches to identify what is hot versus what is cold and provides hints to the OS to do the uh, management. Uh, in addition to uh, these techniques, there has been also increasing support in the OS to move the data faster. For example, there was a recent uh, 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 work at ASPLOS, I, part of which I believe is also integrated into the OS, to support parallel and concurrent migrations across different memory at the same time. Finally, there has been a lot of work in the hardware community also. For example, like do the management at the memory controller level. So this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on the software aspect of it, but I definitely believe there is a lot of opportunities for both hardware and software. So let's get into the challenges. Uh, a simple data placement across heterogeneous memory devices in a single system would require essentially placing, identifying some hot data or placing, start with placing the data that is getting allocated in a faster memory and periodically assess what is their hotness and coldness and reorganize them so that the hot data can be uh, uh, kept in the faster memory, whereas the cold data could be moved to kind of a slower memory. And periodically kind of assess this information again and again. While this looks simple, unfortunately it is not so. Because any of these migrations require a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of work in identifying what is hot versus what is cold and moving the data around. Specifically, this is a problem if, there, if you do not have enough number of free CPUs that are lying around. So this talk, I'm just going to focus on like, ways to reduce data movement uh, and why we need to reduce data movement. So for analysis, we're going to ask two questions. Why is page migration so expensive currently in the software? And how is memory accesses and allocations distributed in the overall system stack? Uh, in our work, we have generally looked at like a different classes of applications. These applications have varied from traditional key value stores 
to distributed key value stores, uh, data analytics frameworks, and even traditional file system workloads. But I'm sure there are like even more workloads uh, that we have not yet covered. So let's go into the challenges of software-based migration. Uh, currently, the, we believe there is not enough support in the hardware to kind of uh, tell us what is kind of hot versus what is cold, which means the software or the OS has to track this information. One way is application telling the OS, saying this is what it thinks is hot. But in general, uh, talking to kind of different uh, even companies, it seems like when in general, application developers are not kind of interested in modifying their applications too much. So, means, uh, for, so this means for the OS to kind of detect, uh, let's assume a traditional virtual memory stack where there is a TLB and the page table. Uh, whenever the CPU wants to access the data, uh, if the data is already there in the TLB, then it's not going to access the page table, which means for the software, it becomes harder to track what is hot. So one way currently that is used is to kind of like uh, maybe set the uh, page table entry reference bit to zero, uh, invalidate the TLB. So this would force the CPU to uh, skip the TLB and actually go to the page table, increase reference counters, and do a bookkeeping to kind of like periodically assess what is hot versus what is cold and keep repeating this until some threshold is reached. Now, this just involves a process of actually forcing the applications to uh, tr frequently trigger TLB misses and access the page table. Now, in terms of page movement, the overhead could be allocating memory at the destination, copying pages from the source to the destination and invalidating the older TLB entries, and releasing old memory pages. As you could see, this process of even identifying what is hot versus moving the data, this requires significant data movement overhead in general. If I'm thinking about an application that has terabytes of memory space, this could have a substantial impact. Now, to kind of understand, or just to kind of like analyze the software overheads of just the migration, forgetting even heterogeneity, if I have a two socket NUMA system and I have an OS and an application, we implemented this design uh, 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 of the tracking hotness using some of the existing frameworks that has been already there to uh, 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 do all this TLB invalidation and page table updates. Uh, and we studied this application, which is a Redis in-memory key value store. It's in-memory key value store, but note that Redis also has uh, uh, has to frequently send the data over the network and also has checkpointing mechanism, which needs it needs to store the data to the storage. On my x-axis is different sampling frequencies. So for example, every 100 millisecond would scan 32K pages or every 300 millisecond will scan 32K pages or 500 milliseconds 32K pages. And the y-axis is in terms of runtime, uh, runtime overhead. Uh, we run a fixed workload of like 1 million keys with put and gets. Uh, as you could see, even the cost of like just doing hotness tracking frequently uh, with the foreground threads has substantial impact. And that gets multiplied when you also include migration. So in general, hotness tracking and data movement is expensive, and this can have significant impact. And given that most of the applications are becoming more and more kind of like CPU intensive also, so we need some mechanisms to kind of address this problem. So the quick takeaway is that unfortunately, currently there is no organic technique, which is application transparent to identify these factors. While we do not have one takeaway is that I personally feel that uh, we need better hardware infrastructure for tracking what is hot versus what is not. And more importantly, this needs to be exposed to the software. Uh, in the past, in, there have been work on on like doing at the memory controller level, but it is still not clear at what interface and how this would be exposed to the software. Would it be at the page granularity, which could be quite uh, complicated, uh, or it could be at some granularity of ranges? So that's still an uh, open uh, problem. And uh, even for bare metal systems, this could be expensive, but even for uh, something like a virtual machines, this has higher overhead given, the, uh, given that uh, they have multiple levels of page table. Now, beyond this data migration overhead, we also want to understand how are these applications allocating pages? Like where is the page allocation happening? 
So on my x-axis is the kind of different workloads, uh, which includes a combination of in-memory key value stores to uh, distributed key value stores, data analytics, and file system workloads. And the y-axis shows the number of memory accesses that are happening. So we kind of split this into two categories. One is a set of memory accesses that happens at the user space and one that are happening at the inside the OS. So as you could see, in addition to application level memory access, which is quite high, even for most of these applications, the number of memory access inside the OS is also quite high. That's because the IOs, most of these today's application are IO intensive. Uh, they are IO intensive because they have to frequently move the data to either replicate the data to a remote storage or use networks, or they have to frequently store the data which doesn't fit into the memory. So this means that uh, uh, we need to kind of take into consideration how much of data is the OS allocating and accessing. So it's not just the memory accesses. If you take the page allocation distribution, uh, when I mean by page allocation, I'm not talking about the active working set size, I'm including the total number of allocations. Uh, we kind of break this down a little bit more and split it into application. And for the OS, we again uh, kind of split that into like allocations that are done by the caches, for example, buffer cache or page cache, and all the intermediate allocations that are done at the slab level. Uh, uh, in general, a slab allocation includes all the intermediate data structures that is done by the OS, for example, say journal or socket buffers or inode structures or so on. And if you see the page breakdown, uh, in addition to application, for these applications, the number of allocation that happens inside the OS is also quite high. So the high level takeaway is that in addition to focusing on application level data placement, it's important to kind of focus on how we place the data or pages that are allocated inside the OS. And that is critical specifically for modern IO intensive applications that are either distributed or have to frequently store data mm -hmm. to the storage. So uh, with this high level motivation, I'm next going to discuss our like first level solution, which is uh, kernel level object placement. So our current approach, which is kind of the first step towards addressing this problem, is we designed a system called KLOC, which is a new abstraction for managing kernel level objects. So in general, what we observed was that most of the prior work ignored the kernel object placement and mainly focused on application pages. But here we refer to kernel objects as all the data structures and buffers allocated by OS subsystems, drivers, uh, slab allocators, caches, and so on. So uh, just to kind of give a brief example, so any of the cache allocations inside the OS, for example, file system could be like generally something like page cache alloc, whereas any of the slab allocations or any of the data structure allocations inside the OS is generally using the slab allocator, say for example, KMLOC, but there are other uh, allocation interfaces also. So before jumping into how we solve this problem, we want to kind of understand uh, uh, like what is the nature, how long these kernel objects exist? Because that would uh, determine how do we actually like uh, 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 place the data. So on my x-axis is the same set of application and the y-axis is the lifetime in terms of milliseconds. We again split these objects in terms of application pages, page cache pages, and slab pages. As you could see, uh, in, uh, unlike the application pages, the uh, allocations that are done inside the OS have shorter lifetime, which means they get used by some specific request, immediately they get freed up. So specifically, slab allocations are like, uh, you allocate some request and kind of release them. And when I mean by lifetime, Note that some of these allocations could be reused across different, for example, if I take a networking subsystem, uh, uh, it has its own allocator over the slab, which means it would, uh, uh, it would try to kind of uh, allocate an object, use it and try to kind of reuse the object. So we're just looking at the phase at which the application uses it and then kind of releases it. So one thing is that is clear, given the shorter lifetime of some of these kernel objects, uh, and the really uh, 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 high time for the 
regular page migrations and page walks, it looks like we cannot just rely on like walking through the entire page table and then start moving because by the time we finish this process, the kernel objects would have been released. So there would be no point in moving these objects from one memory to other memory. So uh, why is kernel object placement hard? In general, because there are diverse assortment of kernel objects. Every subsystem has its own way of allocation and there are so many different allocation interfaces. And also the memory allocation part is intertwined, including there is a lot of reuse and deletion parts. Second, the other important challenge that we note is that if we take any of the application page, they are generally related to some process level structure. For example, if you take a heap page, it is related to a virtual memory area structure in the OS. Similarly, the virtual memory area structure is related to a memory structure and the memory structure is generally, generally uh, addressed as the address space. So every heap page is related or has some form of a context. However, uh, setting aside the cache pages or the buffer cache pages, all the other slab allocations do not have any specific context, which means they are not related to any process structure and so on. Now, why is this important? Because if we don't have a mechanism to group them, then it becomes difficult to apply some uniform policies on these objects, which means we need to track each and every kernel object, which could become time consuming. So uh, also we note that most of the current operating systems like Linux and FreeBSD, they support migrations of like cache pages, but in the future, we might need also migration support for even of the small kernel objects, for example, slab allocations. So based on these observation, we came up with this design of KLOG, which is a new uh, abstraction for kernel level object context. Uh, the idea is to enable fluid peering across heterogeneous memory, but also include kernel level objects. The basic idea is that come up with a mechanism that can group related objects that serve application requests. Now, for example, uh, a one simple example is that let's take a file. When an application performs some IO operation, let's say we open a file and do a set of IO, there are a bunch of objects that are allocated inside the file system. So one mechanism could be that to somehow use the file as a kind of a proxy to group all the kernel objects that are allocated on behalf of the file and provide some form of placement policy. The reason behind doing is that by grouping, we could apply some uniform memory placement policies for all objects that are related to some context or some entity. I'm going to give some examples after this. So uh, let's take an example, Redis, which I've been using uh, from the past. So uh, at a high level, the goal, the design of KLOC as KLOC as something like KMAP, which is like a process level map of kernel objects. Uh, all the objects that are allocated, every process has a has a has a K map. Uh, any form of allocation that is done by this application, for example, say Redis wants to checkpoint the data to the storage. Uh, for a file that gets created, we create something called K node. So a K node is just essentially a proxy for an I node. Specifically, this is useful for a, a system like Linux where everything is a file. All allocations, for example, cache allocations are categorized into a cache tree under this K node or grouped under a K node. Similarly, any allocation that happens behalf of this I node or this file are also again grouped together in a slab tree. Now this application Redis might also send the data over network. So we create one more K node, which is, a, uh, which is for the socket object. And all allocations that are done on behalf of this socket are again grouped together in a slab tree. So now we have two K nodes. So at a high level, let's look into the overall flow of how this would happen. An application opens a file, we create a K node. And when, when you open a file, you allocate a bunch of, uh, 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 bunch of kernel data structures. For example, you allocate I node, block, extents, and D entries, and so on. When the application is performing write operation, more objects would be allocated. For example, there would be cache pages that are allocated. Similarly, there would be extents and journals that are also allocated. When the application tries to sync, which means it's trying to force the data to the storage, the block tryer, the BIO uh, structures would be also allocated, which means we can also group them together. 
Now, as a result, we have now grouped all these objects together. And when an application closes a file, this gives a good indicator that this application or this application is no longer going to be using these kernel objects. So that gives us a proxy that uh, for any of the objects that are not yet deleted, which are still floating around, it's okay to move them to a slower memory without impacting performance. Now, what this helps is that it avoids the need to unnecessarily go through the entire page table, look for each object for its hotness and coldness, and apply instead, as opposed, you can just apply uniform memory policies, which means you can say all the objects of this K node or this I node, which has currently become inactive, can be moved to a slower memory without impacting significant performance. So in general, grouping avoids tracking, ind independently tracking kernel objects. Uh, while, uh, while this is our kind of a high level hypothesis of this work, this is not without challenges. First is that we have to kind of like build this K map, which is a unified structure for all the kernel objects allocated on behalf of this process. Clearly, uh, a, a process could have multiple K nodes. Similarly, each K node could be accessed by multiple CPUs for a single process, and this could quickly become the contention bottleneck because we still need to enable, make sure that we kind of like synchronize access when we kind of add something or remove something from the structures. While we have taken some steps to kind of solve this problem by utilizing capability in Linux, say for example, having per CPU KMAP caches, which is nothing but a linked list of most frequently accessed uh, uh, objects by these applications. Uh, we still believe this is not if very well optimized because it's still a linked list. And for some applications or for some CPUs that end up accessing a lot of kernel data structures, the linked list could become a bottleneck. So definitely there is more opportunity to kind of improve some of this uh, uh, mapping capability. There are other challenges also. Uh, while our goal is to kind of avoid frequent migration of kernel pages or any of the slab objects, but we believe that to reduce pollution and kind of the faster memory, which is already capacity constrained, we still need some form of migration, although it might not be frequent. Although there is support for migration for like the traditional cache pages, there is no support for migrating slab allocations. That's because some of these slab allocated objects can be referenced physically using physical address, and that makes it challenging. So uh, we, Try, we have tried to kind of like uh, uh, overcome this problem specifically for objects that are not kind of referenced physical using physical address by creating a wrapper called KLOC wrap, which essentially is a, is a stopgap solution that replaces some of these allocations that are done using KMalloc to VMalloc. No, please note that VMalloc was introduced as a virtual malloc capability inside the OS and it's typically used for larger allocation. So, which is why I'm kind of stressing that this is a stopgap solution and we need some better infrastructure. Beyond vmalloc, we also added support for migrating vmalloc pages. Currently, vmallocs don't have support for migration. So we added an vmap vmallocs have an anonymous virtual memory area structure, or it's essentially kind of a pro proxy address space. So we utilize that capability to support migration. So uh, in uh, so the but uh, when we went through this uh, pursuit, we did learn a lot of lessons. For example, vmallocs can be slow. Kmallocs have been optimized for years, but vmallocs has not been optimized much, which means they could be slow, potentially slow. Specifically, the number of memory allocations are high. So we tend to kind of reduce the migrations of the kernel objects as much as possible. Then also, uh, our current ongoing work is essentially focusing on can we, instead of relying on vmalloc, can we extend support for the slab allocator to support migration? What can we do better to support uh, slab migrations? We also face certain other issues, which are most kind of slightly, that are slightly impl implementation based and some of them are conceptual. Uh, one example is that some of these allocations are allocated by different threads inside the kernel, which could be done at the background. So for example, let's take a network uh, driver that has, uh, that's receiving data over the network. So in the receive buffer, which is like kind of a socket buffer, these allocations happen by the driver even before it is related to a socket. So that makes some of the mappings difficult. 
so I would encourage to kind of look at our paper, which kind of like discusses what is the kind of a stopgap solution that we do. But at a high level, what I want to highlight is that if we want, we need to create a better mechanism to somehow related all the operating system objects in a better way. So to kind of briefly uh, evaluate and show like what is the benefits of KLOX and what are the implications, uh, we want to understand how effective is KLOX in improving overall IO performance, specifically applications that are IO intensive, uh, and can it reduce page placements in slower memory and reduce page migration by effectively reducing the pollution in the faster memory? And uh, how sensitive it is to kind of like factors like the memory capacity and the memory bandwidth across these heterogeneous memory. Unfortunately, we do not have a software, we do not have a infrastructure where we can essentially change the, uh, uh, don't have a heterogeneous memory where the virtual memory can essentially place the data. So because we are running this large scale application, uh, profiling using a simulator is also going to be hard. So we use the capabilities of some of the, uh, uh, some of the slightly previous generation as well uh, systems to apply thermal throttling, which means uh, when thermal throttle, if there is a two socket machine, we take one of the socket as kind of the slower socket, apply thermal throttling to reduce its bandwidth to kind of 5X. This bandwidth could be reduced even lower. So in our paper, we also kind of discuss uh, like how KLOC can benefit something like a hardware control 3D X point, but the benefits could be limited because in general, the software doesn't have too much say on how to place the data. So for our comparison, uh, we take an optimal system where there's an infinitely large, faster memory. Uh, we compare against a strategy where uh, you just essentially try to allocate all the application pages and the kernel pages to fast memory. If it is kind of used, then simply switch to slower memory. And when it becomes available, again, start allocating faster memory. Uh, we also compare against uh, something called Nimble. Nimble is a, a state-of-the-art system that provides a capability to do parallel and concurrent migration. But please note that it can only support uh, placement of application pages. It doesn't take into consideration the placement of kernel objects yet. Uh, and finally, our proposed system, which doesn't, which not only kind of like places application pages, but also focuses on placement of kernel objects. So to understand the overall performance on my x-axis is the same set of application that I started uh, this talk with. The y-axis shows the speed up relative to always using slower memory. So clearly, if you use slower memory, the performance is going to be worse. So in this graph, taller the bars, better the performance. As you could see, if I place everything in faster memory, I have infinitely larger faster memory, the performance boost is going to be very high. But using some of the naive techniques, which means that if you just greedily allocate all the fast memory with available objects without focusing on what is the important objects to place and what is the important objects to move, very quickly we'll end up polluting the fast memory. As a consequence, there are going to be a lot of allocations in the slow memory. Similarly, uh, as a consequence, there is a huge substantial uh, degradation in the performance. Similarly, if you use something like Nimble, which only focuses on like detect hot and move around pages. So it doesn't focus on essentially placement or doesn't consider any of the kernel level object placements. So it only does placement of application pages. The performance is significantly lower even compared to a naive approach. In contrast, KLOC not only considers placement of application pages, but also kernel object, but more importantly, it tries to reduce the pollution in the faster memory. So it looks at a specific file or specific socket, looks at all its objects. If this file is currently getting used by application, which means it's currently active, tries to place those objects in the faster memory. If it is not getting used, then moves around. More essentially, rather than uh, our point here is to say that there could be better abstractions than KLOC. We are currently using K node and K map. But more in sense, what we are essentially saying is that instead of just detecting on techniques to detect what is hot and cold, if we have better context, then that provides a capability to more efficiently place data and move data around. To understand how much KLOG can reduce allocations and migrations on my X axis is number of page cache allocations, slab page allocations, and overall migrations. 
the y axis shows the number of pages that were actually allocated in slower memory in orders of 10 million pages so which means lower the bar better the performance because you are reducing those allocations on a slower memory as you could see compared to both naive and nimble because klock can reduce the pollution in the in the in the in the in the fast memory first it is able to increase the number of allocations to the fast memory also it's trying to reduce the number of migration so it also reduces the migration overhead so uh, uh, just to kind of show like the bandwidth sensitivity i'm going to briefly discuss over this here the uh, we kind of vary the capacity of faster memory and uh, using thermal throttling we vary the bandwidth so here 1 is to 8 indicates uh, the DRAM, we cannot make the DRAM go faster. We can only reduce the bandwidth of DRAM. So we use DRAM as kind of the faster memory, which is one, whereas like we reduce the bandwidth of slower memory by eight times or four times and two times. So even when there is the bandwidth is really low, k -Lock can still provide better performance. So the high level takeaway in the first part of my talk is that for managing heterogeneous memory, uh, we believe that OS support or efficient OS support is definitely essential. So it is important that besides application data, kernel level object placement is also critical. Uh, so our first step is creating a new abstraction to provide some form of uh, object level, uh, kernel level object context abstraction. But we believe there is a more better opportunity for uh, integrating uh, uh, application as well as kernel objects, which is kind of what is our ongoing work. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, briefly highlight that this problem is not just for a single system with an operating system and application, but this problem could be even more complex for virtualized system. So for example, in a virtualized system, a question revolves around is, how do we expose heterogeneity? For example, should we expose the heterogeneity only at, at the hypervisor level? Or should the guest operating system be also kind of like made aware of the available heterogeneity or even at the application? Specifically, we feel that uh, at the hypervisor level, if you want to do page migration, the overhead could be even higher. Because let's say if the guest operating system has to modify the page tables frequently, that requires some form of kind of interaction with the uh, hypervisor. So our high level approach was essentially uh, expose this information to the guest operating system with a simple philosophy that the guest operating system has a better information about what type of pages these applications use. For example, whether they are using heap pages or IO cache pages or network buffers, whereas the hypervisor doesn't have this information. So to quickly come to the high level design of our approach, uh, to kind of delegate this responsibility and split the responsibility between the guest operating system and the uh, and the and the hypervisor, uh, we designed a, a guest operating system level manager, uh, which would delegate the allocation responsibility to the hypervisor. But in addition to that, because the hypervisor has a direct control of the hardware, we delegate this hotness scanning mechanism to the hypervisor, where the hypervisor detects what is hot versus what is cold and provides this information using a shared memory to the guest operating system. However, we do the migration at the guest operating system because of the following reason. First is that while hotness tracking at the hypervisor is useful because it would avoid some of the hardware overheads, Doing at the guest operating system kind of reduces some of the false positives because by the time an hypervisor detects what is hot versus what is cold, the page that the application used could have been released. Uh, specifically, this is used for kernel objects that are like very frequently or infrequently uh, uh, used. Additionally, uh, we also take into consideration about when to do this page migration. For example, uh, irrespective of whether a page is hot or not, if that page is currently present in a processor cache, it might not impact the performance much. So the high level insight is that don't force these page migrations and movement across these heterogeneous memory when the application is utilizing the cache very well. Do it only when the application is not benefiting from the cache. Uh, so uh, our paper essentially discussed some of the other approaches. In the interest of time, I'm going to kind of skip that. Uh, a quick summary of our like coordinated management approach. We use kind of similar applications. Uh, we use graph applications and Redis in this case. As you could see, having a coordinated approach as opposed to 
completely relying on hypervisor, which doesn't understand the application and the guest operating system, or only doing at the guest operating system, the coordinate approach seems to be providing us a better performance. However, having said that, we believe there are a like lot more opportunities in terms of like how to kind of reduce the migrations or data movement completely. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to end this talk in the interest of time, discussing some of the future challenges. Some of this is my personal opinion based on the experience on building these systems. While there is software approaches and hardware approaches, we believe that to solve this problem, that we definitely need some form of co-design between hardware and software. For example, the hardware, it is better for the hardware to provide this hotness information, a presence of what data is present in the cache versus not present in the cache and other mechanisms. Also, we believe that given there is a lot of different memory technologies, I think we, it's time to kind of revisit the virtual memory design by itself and somehow separate the design and the policy separately so that it's easier to add newer technologies. The number of technologies that are going to be added in the next decade is going to be very high. So uh, currently we have a virtual memory system, but if you want to add any new device, it becomes really hard. So can we come up with more flexible policies? Finally, Unlike NUMA, where it just provides very simple interfaces to the user space, we believe that the success of heterogeneous memory is providing better interfaces for applications. More specifically, an application should not only be able to kind of utilize them, but should be able to query them and seek information about the current state of the system so that it could also improve or capitalize on the data placement. So with these challenges, which are yet to be addressed, I'll complete my talk. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sudarshan, uh, for, the, for a really nice talk. Um, so I, I invite the audience uh, to, to pose your questions by using the Q&A option that you see in Zoom. OK, so I don't, we don't have yet any questions. So I, I'll start by, by, by one first question. Um, so Darson, you, you, you talked about the, 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 the need for hardware software co-design and for that to happen when one of, one of the conditions that we have, that we revisit the, the interfaces between hardware and software. Um, and when we, when we evolve into that direction, I guess we'll, we, will, we will face one issue, which is, um, we, we could find us ourselves in a situation where, where we have overlap of roles. So giving you, giving you an, ex an example, um, if the hardware is migrating pages, but also there is some software layer that is trying to do the same thing, we could have a, a pathological scenario where we have, we are duplicating this effort. So how do you, how do you see these roles be, uh, di well divided between these different players? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, so far, we have always faced this problem of like a, a duplication of efforts. If I take, if, if for example, if we take something like uh, uh, like storage devices, like say for example SSD, it internally has its own flash translation layer that ends up doing all the data movement and migration across different uh, 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 different locations in SSD. Uh, over the years, there has been a lot of push to say that whatever SSD is doing internally needs to be exposed to the software because that could have a huge impact on the software because the software could be also doing the same set of things that an SSD's file translation layer could be done. And so there is a renewed interest. So definitely reducing duplication is kind of the key. And that's the important aspect of code design is to kind of like define certain responsibilities of what is expected from the hardware and what is expected in the software. Uh, my personal opinion is that the hardware is in a better position to track some information and provide that information. Whereas the software's responsibility is to actually carry out. The software could decide saying that I want to take the action of migrating these pages, or I might say, no, I don't want to carry because the application is not using. So a question is essentially, uh, uh, how do we kind of delegate this responsibility? My understanding is the hardware is better at tracking and providing more information apart from the, the hardware level counters that we have. And the software should be the one which is essentially finally executing on those patients. Okay, thanks. We, we, have, some, we have some questions in the, in the chat um, from Dong, Dong Lee. Uh, Dong asks, the data placement slash allocation seems to be highly driven by performance. Uh, namely execution time. 
What is your take on other metrics such as energy or reliability? Uh, so, what is, okay, on, uh, yeah. Not yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, uh, so in general, uh, uh, yes, performance has been the key metric, but data movement, in, uh, one, one problem is that in general, data movement could increase higher energy. So uh, my first thought is that if we could reduce data movement and reduce uh, frequent movement of data, that could uh, potentially provide better energy benefits. Uh, the, second, the second aspect is that, yes, we need new metrics. Currently, our metric is just dominated by performance. Uh, uh, so a question is, should we have something like a, uh, where we could decide about what is performance and what is energy and what applications? So general data center applications are driven by SLAs rather than actual numbers. The, so the goal is not to achieve the most maximum performance, but to achieve uh, SLAs. So uh, we, uh, I believe that there are like more opportunities for better metrics uh, in terms of like how, how much energy are we using for any of the data placement approach. And in general, that has been lacking. That's partly because we do not have the technologies in hand. Right. Uh, I think that as we kind of move along, we will probably have better metrics to kind of evaluate these things better. Okay. Then and Antonio Pena, he asks, uh, he, he comments, great ideas discussed in this talk. Is the K-Log software released? Yeah. So the, the, the kernel code is available. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to put the co uh, link. Uh, uh, we are currently like, uh, the kernel code is already available in GitHub. We are trying to add the runtime code, documenting it better uh, uh, because I'm the primary developer, I'm kind of the bottleneck, but I'll soon like we'll be adding the runtime, the user level runtime and some documentations for using it also. Okay, so so one last question. So Dave Hansen, Hansen asks, um, have the kernel modifications been shown to the Linux kernel community? If so, are they receptive to these changes? Uh, not yet. We are in this phase. We are currently like working on like improving the documentation and making sure that it is kind of like easy for the kernel reviewers to review those patches. So that's an ongoing effort that we are currently carrying out. Okay. So I suggested that we close this, that we suspend this, this, this discussion for now and we move on, on to the next talk. Um, so next talk is by Dave uh, Hansen. So, so Darshan, I, I ask you to stop the sharing so that Dave can share his screen with us. Okay, hi everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yes. So hey. maybe I can quickly uh, just uh, just say that, that that we are very welcome to have uh, very very happy to have Dave Anson with us. Dave is from the Intel Open Source Technology Center. Is an x86 Linux kernel memory management maintainer and a long time Linux kernel contributor. And he will be telling us about application transparent memory tiering on the Linux kernel. Okay, Dave, please. Hi, everybody. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, like, like you said, I'm a, I'm a Linux kernel um, developer, I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, I'm currently leading Intel's uh, memory tiering um, Linux kernel project. So, um, I want to start out with a little bit of background here. Um, this may have been a little more intended for the Intel audience, but I kind of wanted to just talk about what NUMA is first, because I, I think this is really important in kind of setting up the, um, the context of this discussion. Um, hardware itself, you know, has NUMA characteristics like the last talk talked about. There are a lot of different ways that memory can be different, <clears throat> but hardware itself doesn't make NUMA nodes. Software is in charge of making NUMA nodes. So there's lots of different things that people have that they call the hardware clusters that that things like Linux turn into NUMA nodes. But it's important to realize that those are all hardware concepts. And Linux has to take those hardware concepts and, trans and translate those into software concepts that get presented up to higher levels of software. And a great example of this is ACPI. In ACPI, there's no concept of, of a NUMA node. They only have a proximity domain. And Linux gets handed a bunch of proximity domains and has to make sense of those uh, and turn those into its software concepts that they can do something with. Um, you know, NUMA nodes are created in very close alignment with, with proximity domains, but, but, they are, uh, but they're not the same. Um, the other thing to remember is that NUMA nodes aren't sockets. This is, this is again, maybe something that's really specific to, to Intel, but people get really um, the first uh, batch of Intel hardware that did NUMA had this really strong relationship between sockets and NUMA nodes. 
And that's kind of been a pervasive uh, concept that's, that's continued. So here's a couple of examples of, of how we can have NUMA nodes in Linux that have nothing to do with the number of sockets we have on the system. And this, this list keeps growing. Um, you know, the, the hardware configurations keep changing and keep getting more complicated. So there's more and more cases where this happens. But just remember when we talk about NUMA nodes in Linux, um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a pretty nebulous concept and it's not really very tied to the hardware anymore. So uh, again, this is actually gonna be really similar to what we talked about in the last talk, but I kind of wanted to give my perspective on it. So there really have been, I think, three eras of, of hardware, um, of, of memory in computing systems. The first one is the, the simple one we all think about in our laptops. Memory is just plain old memory. We have a CPU, we have some memory, all the memory is the same, all the CPUs are the same, and pretty much, uh, you just, you have memory. Memory is memory, nothing's fancy at all. And then uh, the, the second era was the NUMA era. It started in the 90s and we've had lots of different iterations of this, but essentially we have memory that's close to a CPU and a memory that's far away from the CPU. And we, uh, you know, there, there might be differing amounts of it and there might be a hundred of these CPUs sitting around in a system or, um, but, but still all the memory we have in the system is all the same kind of memory. You know, the non-uniform stuff is essentially the distance. It's either near to, to a CPU or far. Um, but that, that, is, that is all the changes in these, in these systems. But nowadays we have some, uh, we have some new problems. Um, you know, one of our, the biggest ones that we've been, uh, you know, very interested in from Intel side has been this new persistent memory. Well, this isn't very much like DRAM at all. Um, it, it looks like DRAM from the outside, but you know, underneath the covers, this is, this was mentioned in the, in the last uh, presentation as uh, um, it's, it's persistent memory. It is essentially something that has, um, you know, uh, it is slower than DRAM, faster than traditional storage, and it plugs into a DIMM socket and it's byte addressable. So what does this mean for us? Well, um, now we have inside of one single socket in the system, we have our CPU and we have these DIMM slots. Well, some of the DIMMs are fast and some of them are slow. And this is, this is a little bit of a change for us from the software side. And there's, there's a lot of challenges here. You know, there are, there are a lot of challenges having to do with dealing with memory as being persistent and the storage, but, but this is really just talking about the capabilities of the media more than anything else. Just that we have fast media and we have slow media sitting next to each other in dim slots. And here's another complication. This is a couple of years old now, but, uh, um, but uh, these, these configurations are gonna continue. Like I think it was mentioned in the last slide, it was high bandwidth memory. This, um, in, this, in this picture, this MCD RAM um, is essentially high bandwidth. It is, uh, it, it's, it's byte addressable. It can be a cache. It can also be um, something they call flat mode where it, it shows up as a new node um, to software. And uh, this, this is higher bandwidth than, than existing, uh, than existing uh, DDR in these systems. So yep, the, the MCD RAM here, that's, which, which is attached inside the package to the uh, processor. So what that means is that we have a processor um, which has some memory on it, which is fast. We have some DIMM slots, which are slow. And, uh, and this is a change. So, um, and then we have another, uh, another problem thrown in here, which is um, also mentioned in the last talk. Um, we are now starting to have, um, traditionally we have these systems where everything attached to the CPU is coherent, it's cache coherent. And basically applications can use it without having to worry about it too much. They don't have to do too many special dances to, to get um, information in and out of that data. Um, so, and traditionally, if you have something plugged into a PCI card somewhere, um, you know, there's data there, you can go get data in and out of it, but it wasn't ever coherent with the CPU. These CXL devices, they look like PCI from the outside. I think the, the physical transport is actually still PCI. But the interesting thing is they've added capability to have coherent memory sitting on these cards. So essentially you're gonna have a PCI card, um, what looks like a PCI card from the outside, it has some memory on it, just like a traditional GPU would physically, but the neat part is it's coherent with the CPU. And so traditionally, if you were writing a, you know, a, uh, an application that used the GPU, for instance, and you wanted to shuffle data back and forth, the CPU and the GPU really can't be operating on the same data at the same time. They can, but you have to be very, very careful about how you access it because the CPU caches are not coherent with the, with the RAM that's sitting on these cards. CXL brings coherency, which means that data can be sitting on the card, data can be sitting on the CPU, and applications can really be written without any functional requirement to know where that memory is located. 
This is really, really cool. This means that you could take some of that persistent memory and you can plug it into one of these cards. Um, you could also take some DRAM and plug it into one of these cards. Um, or you could take something like a GPU, which has uh, you know, higher performance RAM, and you could plug that into one of these cards and you could have a processor on one. So the, the CXL devices are going to be very, very interesting. It's all, um, you know, it's, it's uh, as open as PCI is. So anybody can go build one of these cards. Anybody can go make any kind of configuration they want. So we really expect that there's going to be an explosion of, um, of different kinds of configurations and different vendors that are making these things. Um, and the OSs are going to have to deal with these. They're going to be a, uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting frontier, I expect. So let's, uh, let's, let's step back and see where that leaves us. We have a couple of complications with our, with our, memory, uh, with our memory configuration in, in the system. So, um, CXL will end up looking like this. You know, it's given that picture we had before, we have a CXL card sitting off somewhere. That memory might be fast access from the card. Let's just pretend it's an FPGA um, that has some memory on the card. Um, so let's put it all together. We have fast memory on the CPU. This would be high bandwidth memory, for instance, or MCD RAM. We have kind of slow memory. It's a little slower than that stuff we had inside the CPU, but it's still, it's still okay. We have some really slow memory, let's say it's persistent memory and has really low write bandwidth. Um, and then we have our FPGA added in. So we have a really interesting situation showing up here because um, we have now, we, we can easily, just with the things that we have sitting here in the system today that we can easily imagine, we've gone from one single kind of, of memory media to four in one system. And this really, these systems are really showing up really, really soon. So um, this, isn't, this isn't even very far out. So what I'll say is that we have our three errors. We have our original error where memory is memory. The second one where we have NUMA memory, all memory is the same, but it's different distances. And I really feel like this is entering um, a, a truly a third era of memory management and, and that's heterogeneous memory or, or, or memory theory. So um, what are people doing with these systems? What good is this? Well, it, it turns out that in the systems that we were building, um, like the Knight's Landing system I showed earlier with the MCD RAM attached, it was very, very hard. That system had, a, I believe, a couple of hundred CPU threads. They were each relatively weak, but they all had a pretty nice fast AVX 512 um, ISA enabled on them. So they actually could chew through quite a bit of computing bandwidth. The problem was that the DRAM that we were able to attach to those systems didn't have the bandwidth able to feed all of those CPU cores and all of those fast AVX 512 um, units. So the solution to that was that MCD RAM. Without that in place, you essentially couldn't keep those CPU cores fed. So in that, in that um, hardware architecture, heterogeneous memory allowed the CPUs to actually be utilized. Without that, they would have been sitting idle. And persistent memory is being used essentially for DRAM capacity. Persistent memory is, um, it is cheaper than DRAM um, and the capacities are larger. And so you can get a system that has um, today I believe like eight to one persistent memory to DRAM. So you can get, um, I believe even on a two socket system, you can get six terabytes of persistent memory. So relatively small system, relatively large amount of persistent memory. You can fit more, um, more Optane in these systems than you can fit DRAM. And you can literally just store more data on it. Again, we'll, we'll talk about the, the side effects there, but, but essentially people are buying this because they care about how much memory you can fit in the system. And you can literally cram more PMEM in the system than you can cram DRAM. Um, this also allows people to do things like dial in their, their cost. So since persistent memory is cheaper and um, it's higher capacity, um, maybe you want to have a situation where you have some high performance users in your system. They pay you a little extra money, they get a little more DRAM, they get a little better performance. You have people that don't really care about that as much. Um, you can sell them a cheaper system. Um, you can give them a larger uh, amount of persistent memory and a lower amount of DRAM. And uh, maybe they don't care that they get, they get the very um, top performance. So this lets people build solutions where they can kind of dial in the cost versus performance on the systems. And these also are gonna let us maximize device performance. I think GPUs are kind of the marquee example here. Um, GPUs, of course, uh, are uh, very memory hungry. Um, and we spend a lot of time moving data on and off GPUs um, in, in these architectures. Um, having this, data out on the device where, where the software that's being written doesn't really have to care where it is. This really helps maximize device performance because you can write things on the GPU to access the memory. You can write it on the CPU to access it. And you don't have to really worry as much about the handoff about where the data is actually located at any given time. So this helps us uh, maximize device performance. And this actually also helps 
um, ease the, the software burden of writing software that, that um, operates in these environments. And the other interesting thing that's happening is, as I mentioned, there have been hardware platforms that have been built, um, like that nice landing platform where they really were limited by their DRAM um, performance. Like literally the, the width of, of the CPU's path to DRAM was one of the limiting performance factors. And people are also building these systems with very, very wide paths to their IO devices. So we have, um, you know, the DRAM path is still, is still wider, of course, but when you have a saturated DRAM path, maybe you don't care about peripheral performance very much. And you can actually stick some DRAM in that peripheral bus, um, essentially on a CXL device. And you get memory performance out of both the direct attached DRAM and the peripheral bus DRAM, the stuff that's CXL attached. So you can actually increase your overall memory bandwidth in the system by throwing some memory um, on, on the CXL device. So there's a, there's a huge number of people that want to do um, heterogeneous memory for something. Um, and, and there's a, and I'm sure more cases will emerge here, but as you can see, there's a, there's a huge need for this and a lot of different people who want this in the practice. So um, let's take a quick look at, at how this ends up looking in practice. Um, here we're um, just kind of wanted to give an idea that um, there, this also isn't a case of saying, hey, one of these things is better than the other. Um, uh, for instance, we can see here that uh, like the best read and write bandwidth, of course, comes from MCD RAM in this example, our, our nice landing high bandwidth memory. Um, but it has a, uh, a big disadvantage that it has a, a, very, uh, a very high cost. You know, putting all that memory close to the CPU um, it, it's expensive and you can't take all the memory and make an MCD RAM in the system. Um, and we can also see that it has slightly worse read and write latency than the DRAM, uh, which is interesting. Um, we also see that there's a, a capacity trade-off. You know, the persistent memory has the very best capacity and the very best cost, but, uh, but it doesn't have very good read and write bandwidth. And here's the big problem in the end. We look over on the right side. Right now, we have something called the, uh, and this is x86 specific, but we have a, something called the ACPI um, system locality table. And this says, this was essentially built in the NUMA era, era and it tells us exactly how far away from a given CPU ran, um, a given piece of memory is. And it's kind of interesting here. So we've taken all of these things on the left side there, the read and write latency, read and write bandwidth, cost and capacity, maybe not cost, but, um, and we kind of compressed that down to one number. And this will say essentially lower numbers are better, higher numbers are worse. But something really, really odd here is that we can see that universally the performance of MCD RAM is better than the performance of PRAM, of PMEM. But for some odd reason, um, the NUMA distance to set is very, very high. And so that this is this is unusual. Uh, it looks weird. So uh, why was that? Um, so it turns out that um, it turns out that this MCD RAM was very, very valuable. And so they actually didn't want applications using it by default. And so the solution to this and the platforms that they built this into was to set that NUMA distance really, really high so that, um, so that applications who used it um, would actually, nobody would get it by default. By default, the applications would go after this, this NUMA distance of 10 and they would never go after that MCD RAM. So basically things had to go looking for it and, uh, and they weren't able to find it unless they did that. Well, this was great for applications that knew what they were doing. Applications that could look at a system and say, hey, look, um, I'm running on a particular version of, a, of an Intel system. I know that that thing with a 35 NUMA distance is my really, really fast RAM. I'm gonna ignore what the hardware tables told me. I'm gonna go after and use that, use that memory. Well, uh, that works great for one system, but it doesn't work great when you actually have a huge variety of these things like we have coming up with these CXL devices. So this creates a problem. Um, so here again is that ACPI table that we have, and you can see here that um, it's also a little problematic because it doesn't have things like units. We had that report card where we have things like read and write bandwidth and even the capacity, and all that we end up with this, in this table is a single unit that doesn't tell us very much about, about the memory. So um, here was our solution to that, which is this new ACPI table. You can see it has a lot more information here. We have things like the uh, read and write latency actually called out in this table. Um, and they, they differ. And they also tell us about the processor attachment. Um, it tells us which processor is closest to them and essentially which, which memory should be preferred by the processors. So this gets us um, kind of to be able to, um, instead of having to infer what should be used first, this table kind of actually gets to express from the hardware designers which RAM they want you to use first. So um, this is really, really important. 
Um, and this gives, uh, this gives Linux the ability to go and figure out how to actually configure its memory management to, to understand these systems um, without having to, to foist all the burden on application designers. So I won't go this in too much detail, but that's there. Um, so what does this end up looking like in the US? Um, now I'll talk about things that we're actually doing in the Linux kernel to, um, to, uh, to kind of uh, comprehend these heterogeneous systems. Uh, the first is something called um, the KMEM utility. So um, like was also mentioned in the last talk, hardware kind of has the option here. Hardware can either manage the tiering. Um, Intel calls this two-level memory or 2LM. And we have a DRAM cache that sits in front of um, in front of a large persistent memory tier. And so the hardware will, um, it shows you the capacity of the persistent memory and the DRAM is kind of absorbed as a, into a you know, non-software visible cache. This is great. Um, it allows applications to just, um, that have no knowledge of heterogeneous memory to, to spool up and, and just use it. They get some of the benefits of DRAM, they get the capacity of persistent memory, everybody's happy. Except um, the, the cache has some, um, trade-offs. Uh, it was designed to be a direct map cache. And so that means that every location in persistent memory only has one location it can be cached in and DRAM. And that's different from processor caches that have some level of associativity, where there are a couple of ways inside of an individual um, line that can actually have the, um, so that the conflicts are reduced. So in practice, when we actually at Intel got these um, systems in a bunch of people's hands, we noticed that uh, people weren't getting the hardware performance out of it that they wanted. So um, instead of having them all rely on their um, uh, the hardware caching, we gave them a secondary solution, which was put the hardware, take it out of its caching mode and put it in its persistent memory mode, where this is called um, app direct mode. And so we would put this in the app direct mode and we would take it out of the storage mode essentially inside the kernel, and then we would hot plug it as if it was normal DRAM back into the Linux kernel. So um, this lets applications get, get transparent access to persistent memory. They don't have to do anything to get access to it in software. And they don't have any of the problems that they encountered with the hardware caching mechanisms. So some people really like this, this works great. But the problem is right now that, um, uh, and, and one of the benefit I'll mention here is since the DRAM capacity isn't lost, this lets folks get 100% of the capacity back and use all of that for their applications, which is really important for some people. So, um, and please give me a time check and I'm not sure exactly when you want me to, to finish up here, but please let me know if there's a, uh, um, you need me to uh, finish up quicker. So uh, that's the KM um, thing that we have. This actually exists in upstream Linux today. So this is kind of our first step towards the kernel understanding how heterogeneous memory works. This lets you, um, you know, create a heterogeneous memory system in Linux. Sure, I can. Uh, um, the other things that are going on are automatic optimizations. We have the ability to demote memory. These things are currently out of tree. In the last talk, you at, we, they were talking about how difficult it is to figure out hot and cold. Right now, we've punted on that. We essentially took Linux's existing hot and cold mechanism for memory and repurposed it for tiering. So in, in the cases where Linux would kind of swap a page, we simply demote it down to a lower tier. Um, this exists today. There's an implementation out on the Linux kernel mailing list. You can go run it today if you like. We're working, um, trying to get this into the upstream kernel um, and working through feedback from folks in the Linux community. The other thing happening is, um, is the promotion side. So we have demotion, we need that, but once the data gets into the slower member, we need it to be able to get back fast. Again, the thing that we're doing here is repurposing an existing kernel subsystem, something called auto pneuma, which forces page faults, gathers statistics and moves memory closer to the CPUs which are accessing it. So we basically repurpose that instead of having those, those page faults move memory close to CPUs, we have them um, promote the memory to higher, uh, higher, faster tiers instead of those slower tiers. Um, again, we have a public implementation of this. The patches have been posted, um, but we're expecting this to get merged after those demotion patches. So essentially, it's it's simply queued down the demotion patches. And then going forward, we also have um, something to help applications kind of build policy around this. Um, this is when you have a when you have a tier, you may want to make sure that certain applications get access to it. Certain ones don't. And um, this is uh, taking the form of enhancements to Linux's existing NUMA APIs, which set memory policies. One of these allows you to select an entire tier instead of like a single NUMA node um, in terms of where you prefer memory to be allocated. 
and the second thing here is C groups. So um, some ability to set actual limits, um, you know, 10 gigabytes of DRAM, eight gigabytes of persistent memory, or no DRAM, lots of persistent memory. So you can kind of mix and match however you'd like. Um, this is a little farther out um, and there isn't an implementation of this available, but, uh, but that's kind of where we're going next. So um, this is kind of a high level look at, at where the Linux kernel support is, but, um, but, but essentially we have allocation support um, we have the discovery support to tell you um, all that information from that ECPI table. You can get to that from applications. And, and right now we're working on the, uh, the optimizations and things like the limits for, this, for the uh, for memory tiering. So that's uh, pretty much all I had. I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dave, for the great talk. <laughs> um, let me see if there are any questions. By, by the way, since we have a, like, a smaller community, uh, you can also raise hand, okay, if you want to place, place any question. Um, before I see any other question, Dave, let me ask you, when, when, you, when you have larger capacity, like for instance, as in the case of Optane, you, you will tend to use large pages. Um, and, and this may imply that we, we, need, we need better support for large pages, namely migration of large pages. Um, uh, Sudarshan was talking a bit about that in his previous talk. Can you tell us a bit about uh, support for migration of, la of large pages in, in Linux? Um, are you talking about the HTTP large pages or the transparent large pages that we have? Uh, yeah, probably the transparent large pages, but as you wish, of course. Um, so the transparent ones, there is migration support. Um, so the explicit APIs where our NUMA um, policies will actually where you actually ask for them to be moved from node to node, I believe can do it these days without breaking up those pages. Um, in the old days, they had to be broken up, but I think we currently have support to migrate them. So I believe that's there. That may be only available in recent kernels though. So, um, but I could be mistaken <laughs> um, because there's also a secondary mechanism that we have, which is UCBFS and that, um, that one, I, I could be confusing the two mechanisms, so. Okay, sure. We can take this offline. Uh, sure. uh, Tony, Tony Pena, do you have a question, right? Yeah. Uh, would you say a few words on uh, on these optimizations that you mentioned? Well, this is more of um, what the kernel will do behind applications' backs to try and make sure that, that the system is optimized without the application doing it. And this is really just a, a, a short way to say those uh, that promotion and demotion mechanism that I mentioned earlier. So. Optimization of applications kind of behind the uh, behind their backs. Thanks. Okay, so since since we are a bit uh, late on time, and if there there is no other further question, let me thank Dave again. And uh, Dave, I'll ask you to to close the sharing the screen sharing. And I I kindly ask uh, 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 Xu Liu, are you are you there? Okay, great. Okay, so 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 let, let's move on. So uh, I have the pleasure to to, to introduce uh, uh, Professor Xu Liu. By the way, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Please correct me. Uh, he he's an assistant professor at North Carolina State University. He works on several open source profiling tools. Um, some of them are are, are widely are, are widely used uh, at universities, uh, DOE, national laboratories. And industrial companies and today he'll tell us about that in his talk about guide data placement in heterogeneous memory and with profiling. Zhu, uh, take it take it away. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm very happy to hear uh, to, to share my uh, my research about this the data placement uh, in the heterogeneous memory with profiling. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, here is some motivation part. I think all of us already know that the, this technique, so I will not go deep. So, um, uh, but only I want to highlight that uh, there are different memory technique, uh, techniques here. And uh, if we view them as the heterogeneous memory system, so we can see that they all can fall into two categories there. One is the fast memory component and the, the other is the slow memory component. So typically the fast memory, uh, the, the slow memory component has a higher latency, the lower bandwidth, uh, and uh, but larger capacity. But for the fast memory component, uh, it's the opposite. It's the lower latency, higher bandwidth, and the limited capacity. 
So the thing there is that how can we prioritize uh, the data objects uh, to place uh, uh, which memory component? Okay, this is the open questions here. Uh, so there's some related work here. The state of art tools, they, they are trying to, uh, to analyze the, the data object and uh, uh, get the, the memory access patterns or the, the frequency of the memory accesses uh, to see that, the, to tier the data objects there. So typically they use the instrumentation and a pure software way uh, to characterize the, the data object. So the, the, the limitation is pretty obvious. The overhead is high. And uh, there's no hardware details. Everything actually is the uh, it's from the, uh, the 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 software perspective. And also that the uh, it's very hard to scale to the production code because this is the uh, the the instrumentation based the overhead is so high. So uh, in our research, uh, we would like to develop a lightweight tool that can help us to pinpoint the problematic data objects that we can. Uh, we can do the data placement better. Okay, so uh, we, we have this, the, uh, the profiler cost of uh, ProfDP. So the ProfDP, uh, the, the basic idea for this ProfDP is that we do the profiling instead of modeling to quantify the behavior of the data objects used in the program and the, to guide the data placements in different memory. Okay, so we directly do the measurement uh, so uh, how can we do that? Typically, we have three steps here. The first one is that we identify the features to describe the data objects. So this means that we need to consider the different features uh, between the, the different memory components. For example, the latency, the, the bandwidth, this is the difference between the uh, heterogeneous memories, right? And also that we consider some data object its own features like this, the importance and size, which we'll show later. And we are trying to describe the data comprehensively to uh, really reflect this behavior. So the second one is that we do the profiling to, uh, to get the, the metrics we want to guide the data placement, okay? So here that we mainly use the two uh, profiling techniques, so which we believe pretty normal here. One is the differential analysis. So this means that we compare the, the profiles in different runs and uh, we can identify the difference between the two profiles there. So I will show that why we use that later. And also the other one is we use the data centric analysis. So which means that we attribute all of the metrics to the data objects used in the program. So this means that all of our data placement policy is based on the data objects instead of the pages. So this gives a little bit more semantics information into the program because we believe that the data objects on the data object level the memory access pattern, or even that's the, the place, uh, placement policy should follow some, some, some way, some similar way, or follow some pattern way. And uh, also the third step is that we also combine all of the, uh, the, the metrics collected and derive a useful metric. We call this the moving factor. And we use this met uh, metric to rank the, uh, the the rank all of the data objects used in the program, and uh, this can easily to let the uh, let the the users to to tier the data and uh, make the decision for the data placement. So here is the the four features I mentioned uh, previously. So uh, the uh, all of them are pretty important uh, to describe a data object. The first one is the latency sensitivity. So it means that we would like to quantify how sensitive one data object is to the latency. So this means that uh, if this is sensitive to the, to the latency, then we would like to place this data object into faster memory with lower latency. Because that if you increase the latency, that's the accessing this data object will incur larger delay, right? Because it's more sensitive. So similarly, we have this bandwidth sensitivity. So this means that if the, the whether the data object is sensitive to the bandwidth. So if it is, we would like to put this data objects in the faster memory with higher bandwidth because that we want to reduce the, the, the we, would, we would like to enjoy the, let this data object enjoy higher bandwidth to reduce its access latency. So the third feature is the importance. So importance means that how important of this data object? This means that if this data object is progressively used in the program everywhere almostly, so this means that this, uh, this data object is really important and uh, we would like to uh, first uh, 
make the decision on this important object first, right? Otherwise, if this object is definitely not important, it's only used once, for example, and uh, people will not care about this place. So probably you just place that into the slow memory. And also we have this size. So we, we prefer to place the, the objects with smaller size. Why? Because that we, because this uh, fast memory has a limited capacity, we would like to leave the space for, for other objects as well. So if that you have a important uh, object with some of the sensitivity, but with smaller size, we would like to first uh, place that data object into the fast memory. Okay. So then that's the typically for the uh, for the size only for the size that's in, uh, it's simple to collect right we can definitely monitor the size of the allocation it's easy to know that but for all of the other three it's not straightforward to see how can we quantify the different sensitivities and the importance of the data objects so let, let me see talk about how we do that so the first one is that we would like to quantify the the latency sensitivity so definitely we do the profiling so how can we do that Okay, so actually we would like to do the differential analysis. So this means that we profile the program twice, but with different configurations. And then through the differential analysis uh, between the two profiles, we can quantify the latency sensitive, sensitivity. Okay, so there's the one expectation. So if an object is latency sensitive, then its average latency to access this, to access this data object does not change, okay? If does not change when the program with the same input and same parallelism running on the machine with higher memory access latency, okay? So for example, let, let's see the, the code here. Uh, let's see the, the, the view here, okay? So I have two kind of the configurations, okay? So one is that, uh, for example, I run this on the NUMA, okay? On the NUMA machine, one, uh, so here is the two NUMA nodes. So first I place the data and all the computation on the same NUMA node. Then I run the program. So this means that I can enjoy a lower latency because that's the, the DRAM, the data is co-located with the computation, okay? Then that I compute the average latency accessing the data object, okay? Then I know that's okay, this is the lower latency in the lower latency, um uh case then i will do another run okay do another second profiling run that i place the data into a remote memory okay so this means that every computation that inside the, the that new node will access a remote memory it suffers a higher latency so then that's the i compare the profile result from these two runs okay and see that how the average latency to each of the data objects we monitor the changes. So if they change, then we know that, oh, this is latency sensitive. If it's not change, then this means it's not that sensitive. Okay, so, so this, is the, uh, this is the way that we do the differential analysis. Okay, so this means that we run the two profile, uh, uh, profile runs and uh, uh, we change the latency. We change the we manually change the memory access latency by placing the data into a remote all the data to the remote memory in the NUMA node. Okay. So here that we use this the equation that to compute the latency sensitivity. So definitely we we use the in the once we place all of the data in the uh, slow memory minus uh, uh, average latency when we place this data object in the fast memory over that's the average latency in the fast memory. So this is the just the computation a percentage number there. And then how can we get the average latency? So average latency actually, uh, uh, we can get that from the uh, performance monitoring unit, uh, like the Intel, they provide this precise event-based sampling and the AMD provides this IBS, the instruction-based sampling. They can always provide this latency information can help us to sample the latency for the memory accesses and we can compute the average latency on top of this, uh, uh, this PMUs. Okay, and also similarly, we have this bandwidth sensitivity. How can we compute that? So uh, according to the, the, uh, the latest law, you can see that the, well, we, we compute the bandwidth by, uh, uh, by considering the, the memory level parallelism and also the latency. 
So here we have the expectation here that if we think that is the bandwidth uh, sensitive, then that means that if we change the uh, if we change the memory level parallelism, okay, if we change the memory level parallelism, and uh, we would expect that the the uh, the average latency of the memory uh, of the memory accesses do not change, okay. So still, let's uh, go to see that the uh, the different differential analysis we uh, we run twice in the program. So uh, in the first run, uh, in the first run, we just uh, have one less one thread to run on the local memory there. So you can see that there's no remote mem memory access. There's only one new node, but only one core to run. So uh, so that's the we believe that it incurs small memory level parallelism. And then we do a second run. So you can see that we enable all of these four cores to run the code. And also that's in the same same new node. And uh, then we have four cores. We believe that that's the we enlarge the memory level parallelism, okay? So with this, uh, we can compute that's the, how the average latency changes when we change the memory level parallelism, right? So you can, with this, we can quantify the bandwidth sensitivity. And also that we have this, the, the, uh, the metric for the importance. So the importance means that how can we, uh, how we think, uh, quantify this data object used throughout the program and whether it increases a lot of latency by accessing that. So with this is uh, we just uh, use this uh, equation that we uh, we accumulate all of this, uh, the latency accessing this data object and over all of the, over the total latency over all of the, the, the data objects. So this can give you a percentage for how much, uh, how much percentage of the latency you access on this data object A only over all of the objects. And for the size, it's, uh, it's easy that we directly get the size of the data allocated. So with this, we can get the uh, compute the, the moving factor. So you can see that for the moving factor, we would like to think about the, uh, the if it's a uh, uh, latency sensitive is higher or it's more important, but with smaller size, we would like to first uh, place that into the fast memory, right? Similarly, if it is higher bandwidth sensitive, and the higher for the importance, and the, but the smaller in size, we play that. So you can see that that's why we uh, we have this uh, the the uh, the latency sensitive, bandwidth sensitive, and the importance uh, uh, is proportional to the uh, the the moving factor, but the size is the reverse proportional to the moving factor. So that is the we use that to do the computation. And uh, here are some <clears throat> implementation details there. So we use this uh, the address sampling. So as I mentioned that we, we use the performance monitoring unit to support this address sampling like the Intel, they ha it has the, the, the precise event-based sampling and uh, the AMD has this instruction-based sampling. And uh, uh, for this, they can monitor the memory accesses as, or they do the sampling and also capture the, the latency in the cycles to access uh, for, the, for each of the memory access sampled. And uh, uh, also we do the data centric analysis. We attribute all of the samples we uh, collected from the performance monitoring unit to the, the data objects like the static data or the heap data. So uh, how can we do that? Because that we can always track the, the, the data range allocated for the static data in the symbol table. And also we can overload the, the malloc family functions to track the memory ranges allocated for the heap data. Also from the PMU, once you sample a memory access, we can get the effective address. So using that effective address, we can always assort it to the sample with the, with the data object. So this is the, uh, we can always get the data object with the metric mapping there. So this means that at the end, the tool will provide the view for all of the data objects and you can directly investigate each of the data objects and uh, place this data object. So it's, Pretty straightforward because that all nearly all of the high-level programming APIs, uh, for example, if you use the Numa control or if you use other things, the, the mankind, they they mostly work on the data objects. So you can do the placement there. So there are some experiment uh, for the uh, for the for the profiling. Uh, we use this Intel Sandy Bridge machine, and uh, <clears throat> so at that time. 
oh, uh, we, we don't have the optim memory, uh, the, we don't have the machine with the optim memory ready. So that's why we use the NUMA machine to simulate or to emulate the, the heterogeneous memory, uh, especially for the NVRAM stuff. Uh, so you can see that we, we use this course uh, developed from the HP lab, and uh, we use that to simulate, uh, to emulate the DRAM plus NVRAM system. Uh, but at that time that we already have is the high bandwidth memory. So we directly use the NAS landing uh, machine that's the, to evaluate uh, the, the DRAM plus the HBM case. So we first evaluate the, uh, the, the overhead of the tool. So the tool, uh, as I said, that is only do the, the sampling using the PMU. So the overhead is not that high. So you can see that the, it's typically less than 6%. Oh, well, some of the, uh, the, uh, the benchmarks, they incur high overhead because <clears throat> if there are a lot of data objects uh, allocated in the program, and if we, we always need to overload all of them, that we, we incur high overhead. Definitely we can uh, reduce this a little bit by, oh, we only are monitoring the data object that is larger than one page. So if we, if we give this cutoff, we can definitely largely reduce the overhead there. And also that we uh, do the profiling, that's do the, the benchmark classification. So you can see that we study a bunch of benchmarks there. Uh, typically, most of them are HPC applications there. And uh, we do the classification uh, for all of them to uh, one, for the horizontal one, you can see it's a sensitive, uh, latency uh, sensitive. The, the vertical one is the bandwidth sensitive. So higher means the, with higher sensitivity. So you can see that some of the application like the MG, it has both higher uh, latency sensitive and higher bandwidth sensitive. But for some of the application, they, they, are, they do not sensitive at all. If the application, they, uh, they are not sensitive to either bandwidth or uh, latency, typically it will not benefit from the performance optimization, especially the data placement uh, optimization in the heterogeneous memory. Okay, typically we would like to uh, focus on some large, uh, higher latency uh, sensitive or bandwidth sensitive applications there. And uh, we expect that they can, uh, they can enjoy uh, more uh, performance optimization benefits. So also we have a GUI that to show the, how the tool uh, show the data centric uh, analysis. So you can see that uh, this is the, the, the top pane shows the source code and the bottom left pane shows the, the data centric view and the bottom right pane shows the metrics there. So you can see that we have this the one data object uh, because this is the allocated on the heap. We monitor the malloc, so it gives you the full call pass to this allocation. So you know that if we click the, the icon, it can map back to the source code. You know that oh, this is the X of uh, data object allocated here. Okay, and then we can see the importance. The uh, the uh, this is the latency for the fast memory. The the latency for the slow mem uh, for, for the slow memory, and uh, we compute the latency sensitivity. And see here, this the sensitivity is pretty high, and also it's very important. It's these data objects account for more than eighty percent of the total latency accessed in the program. So optimizing this will give you the good uh, performance. So so you can see that the this is the really we compute the moving factor, and you can see this X of uh, uh, it's, it's important, this data object, important and the latency sensitive, and also the size is pretty small. It's just a 2% or something. So uh, with this, we can do the uh, uh, placement. So you can see that uh, well, what we, uh, we can get for some of the speed up. So we place top one uh, data object, we place top three data objects, and also we place all of them in the DRAM. So because here we believe the DRAM is a fast memory, this compared to the NVRAM, right? So, um, so you can see that uh, the takeaway here is that it's not that we always achieve the best performance because once you, you are able to place all the data in the fast memory, you can always get the best data, or best performance, right? But here we argue that we place a minimum amount of the data and uh, we do not take all of the uh, complexity of the fast memory, but we can get achievable optimization benefit for the, uh, for the program. So similarly, we have another uh, case study, this on the HBM uh, in nice landing. So uh, it's a similar thing that we can get the moving factor. And uh, with this, uh, the, uh, we identify 60, over 60 heap allocated data objects. And uh, 
but we only need to place top five actually pointed by the tool. So if we place top five, you can see that the it, it, it gets the, the same, exactly the same optimization benefits when we place all of them in the HBM. Okay. So uh, here is the conclusion that the, we, uh, we, we do this, the, the, the lightweight profiler, the PropDP, and uh, we do the, uh, the novel data centric analysis and the differential analysis that can directly quantify the, the sensitivity of the data object and the guides the data placement. And uh, so uh, uh, while uh, uh, we, we, uh, all of the experiments we hear we use is the, on the Newman machine because that at that time that we don't have the, the NVRAM machine out yet. So, but definitely this uh, could try that if we can pour to the Intel opt-in and see what's the uh, interesting insight here. And also there are some other related work uh, in my research group uh, that for the, to characterize the memory access patterns uh, for the, <clears throat> that can be potentially useful for the heterogeneous memory. Uh, for example, one is I developed this the RDX, which is the lightweight profiler based on the performance monitor unit and debug registers to measure the reuse distance. So it's give very lightweight uh, measurements, like five, less than 5% overhead, but it's uh, give the more than 90% of the accuracy. And also another uh, related work is the MAMIF that developed uh, in my group uh, that's the, we do a uh, efficient OS support to support the, the efficient page move across the heterogeneous memory. That is the, uh, the user and the kernel co-design co and the, which balances the, the latency and the throughput of the, uh, the, the page move. Okay, so this is about my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for, for, for a few quick questions and anybody wants to raise their hands? I have I have I have a question. So 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 far in the previous talks, we have been mostly thinking about dynamic uh, page placement or dy dynamic tracking and then migration. Um, and here, when we think about profiling, we typically think about a static so profiling that characterizes ob the objects for the full execution. If we want to use this kind of techniques in an application that has different phases that change. How do you see that happen? Right, right. So if you have the different change uh, phases, definitely that's the, uh, you probably want as the phase change point, you would like to change the data placement policy. So here actually the point, uh, definitely the profiling can, can, can help you identify the phases, that's for sure. But the, the research point for this, uh, for this work is that if we can do a better initial data placement, so later in the dynamic uh, approach, People, the, 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 the dynamic, dynamic solution can largely reduce its effort. For example, the, the measurement overhead or page movement overhead online, right? So that is the, uh, and also that's the, you know, programmer, programmers may, uh, may, may enjoy some portable, uh, portable performance if you, they change to different policy there, right? And also the, the program model, they already provide you the, the, the APIs for you to do the data placement. So that's why we have this profiling that to, uh, to guide the users how to use these APIs, yeah. Yeah, I see, I totally agree. Uh, so Darsen has a, has a question, so Darsen? Yeah. So I was curious, like, uh, 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 so first of all, this is, this is a very, very extremely useful and uh, uh, tool uh, to have. And one uh, question was like, do you notice like significant difference in terms of like, uh, understanding this behavior for HPC applications and non-HPC or non-parallel applications in terms of their variations in behavior? Right, okay, that's a good question. For, well, for now, I don't have any insight of the non-HPC applications much, right? So this is just the beginning of that in my group. So I mostly focus on the HPC applications and or uh, well, I'll say that uh, the, uh, the computation or data intensive applications, yeah. So, but definitely I can imagine that there could be, right, for some of the web server applications, there's no hotspot data, right? If there's no hotspot data, that could be some problem. That's the, um, probably the, uh, the data placement, not only like top five, you probably want to place more data there. I see, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So, so I suggest, suggest that we move to the next talk. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Shashank, are you there? Do you want to share the screen?
Okay, perfect. So, so let me quickly introduce you to Shashank uh, Adavali from University of North, North Texas. He's currently pursuing a PhD um, and he mainly focuses on, on the areas of memory accelerators, conventional and heterogeneous memory systems. He'll tell us about subpage migration in heterogeneous memory systems. Uh, Shashank, please. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me all right and see my screen. Right. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Shashank and I'm a PhD student at University of North Texas. And in today's presentation, I'm going to talk about our work on subpage migration in heterogeneous memory systems. So uh, here are the contents of the presentation, overview, motivation, contribution, uh, look at the workloads we looked into, and then the results and the future work. Let's look at the overview. Uh, I guess with the increase in the memory footprints of modern HPC applications or big data applications, there is a demand for uh, large high bandwidth memory systems. And, and with the introduction of 3D DRAMs and advances in non-volatile memories uh, such as PCM and or Intel 3D point memories, these advances led researchers, researchers to propose uh, newer uh, memory organizations, for example, heterogeneous memory architectures. And in the heterogeneous memory architectures, uh, we have two types of memories, fast memory and slow memory. Typically fast memory is, uh, is, is faster, but it's also expensive and the slower memory is cheaper and available uh, in large sizes. And in typical HMA, heterogeneous memory architectures, fast memory is either used as cache or merged into flat address memory. So in order to take advantage of the heterogeneous memory system, different page placement techniques or page migration strategies have been studied to improve the overall memory performance. Uh, and now for this proposal, we focus on page migration techniques. And with also uh, with the increase in virtual address space from two terabytes to 128 petab petabytes, this led to increase in the virtual address space from 48 to 57. So, that indicates a uh, number of levels in the page tables are going to increase from four to five. I think I can explain these uh, in detail in the further slides. Increasing the number of page uh, page tables also means increasing the access access delay during a page walk. So, but we can reduce the number of levels by increasing the page size. So let's let's briefly look into uh, this issue. Here, uh, I'm showing how the uh, page walk is done in today's systems with address bits of 48 bit virtual address, uh, virtual address space. A typical 48 bit address, address is broken down into uh, five segments. And the first segment in the most significant portion would be mapping to a page map or the level four and the second segment to the page directory pointer, third onto the page directory and fourth onto the actual page table. And the last 12 bits uh, map to the actual page uh, byte offset in the page. So uh, we have four levels in here. So the, the address would be uh, mapping to page map and the page directory pointer, page directory, and then to the page table. So with 57 bit uh, address, we have an increased uh, translation or the page walk, as we can see in this figure, where we have a level five page table and then a page map, page directory pointer, page directory and page table. But uh, we can uh, increase, we can decrease the number of page levels with 
a huge memory with the implementation of huge memory. Uh, let's let's look at the example. So we have a 57-bit address that's broken down into five segments in the typical nine-bit fashion, but in the least significant portion, the 21-bit. Uh, so the instead of 12-bit page offset, now we are using 21-bit uh, byte offset in a page which 21 bit represent two megabyte uh, huge page. So now we have uh, four levels. So if we are comparing a 4K page in two port 48 bit address space, comparing two megabyte page in two, two port 57 bit address space, uh, the delays uh, to walk the page are going to be uh, nearly the same as uh, the previous two port 48 bit or 40 bit address space. But uh, using of or implementing of huge pages uh, poses a different issues like internal fragmentation. So in some applications, uh, only, only some portions of a large page are heavily accessed to the internal fragmentation. So had this uh, been a typical 4K page, there could have been multiple 4K pages being allocated rather than one huge page. So that way we could avoid internal fragmentation in a 4K page. But since we are using a huge page, uh, there is an issue of internal fragmentation. So the idea we propose is to migrate only portions of a huge page called subpages so that we migrate more useful data for each migration we perform. Let's look at the motivation section. Uh, as we discussed, or with large pages, migration overhead would also increase. This is mainly because the amount of data we are migrating or copying from one memory to other memory. And adding internal fragmentation to this issue would reduce the overall benefit of the migration because uh, as we discussed, the internal fragmentation or the page which possesses the internal fra fragmentation, uh, there would be, there can be significant amount of uh, portions of the page that would be unused uh, if we migrate that page to a huge, uh, a faster memory. So uh, before uh, we look into this, uh, understanding this figure, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I did had a slide explaining this, uh, uh, what this figure actually is, but uh, I, I probably won't, might be missing that slide, but I'm going to explain what this slide actually is. So in order to understand the effect of internal fragmentation, we looked into, uh, this is the way we started the process. So first we looked into the number of unique accesses to a 4K page, and we tried to capture this metric of uh, average number of unique access to a 4K page. And then we try to measure the average number of unique accesses to a huge page. And for the second measurement, we try to normalize the number of unique access to a huge page to a 4K, 4KB size so that we can relatively compare the uh, normalized huge page to the 4K page. So once we have these two measurements done, we calculated the ratio of number of unique access to a huge page to a number of unique access to a 4K page. I mean, normalized a uh, huge, huge page to the traditional 4K page. And when, when we put the, uh, when we put all those numbers into a figure, this is what we observed. Uh, it, it, so, in order to understand more about this figure, if you look at uh, the workload A star and on the y axis, on, on the x axis is the workloads, on the y axis is the percent of the ratio of unique access of, to a huge page to the 4K page. Uh, what this means is it's only 80% of the page in a normalized 4K page or a normalized 4K page is only receiving 80% of the access compared to a traditional 4K page. That indicates uh, 
a huge page which is normalized of 4K page is receiving less number of accesses to a normal 4K page or traditional 4K page. That indicates there are more pages being allocated uh, in terms of huge page. So we also observed uh, when we are using huge pages, the memory footprint of these applications were also increased due to the internal fragmentation. And so the idea is how can we uh, get rid of this problem or get over this problem to some extent. So uh, as we as we have explained, uh, the highlighted figures are MCF, MIX1, MIX2, MIX4, MIX5, and Zalan CBMK uh, suffer with heavy internal fragmentation based on the analysis we perform. And so we propose two techniques to migrate only the useful portions of the huge page so that we can, we don't need to migrate unnecessary portions of the uh, huge page that causes the internal fragmentation issue. Now let's look at the contribution of our work. So we, we are proposing two subpage migration techniques or subpage migration with address reconciliation and subpage migration with reverse migration. In the first technique, we migrate subpages from slower memory to faster memory. And we reconcile the subpages or we reconcile the huge page if the all the subpages of the huge page were migrated from slower memory to faster memory. In the second case, subpage migration with reverse migration, we still migrate the subpages at the subpage level granularity, but after a certain period, when the uh, so there is some uh, background that I'm trying to skip, but I'm going to explain in that detail uh, in the further slides. We try to, instead of reconciling the uh, pages with the operating system, we try to migrate the previously migrated pages back to the uh, its original location so that we can skip address reconciliation with the operating system. So uh, here are the brief uh, architecture modifications that we proposed. So we introduced a uh, three, a component called migration controller and near migration queues and a process called address reconciliation. So in a migration controller, we have multiple components inside, a remap table, access counter cache, parting pool buffers, wait queues, and a migration logic. The remap table, uh, it stores the details of the migrated pages. What this indicates is uh, when we are trying to migrate a page from either uh, slower memory to faster memory or faster memory to slower memory, we try to create an entry in this hardware structure so that uh, we can track the pages that are being migrated and the pages that have been migrated. The access counter cache stores the access counts at the subpage level granularity. The hot and cold buffers uh, temporarily stores the migration pages, temporarily stores the subpages during the migration while the page is mi being migrated to slow memory to fast memory. It acts as a temporary storage buffer. Wait queues, uh, we try to store the memory requests uh, which belong to the pages that are being migrated in this particular wait queue so that uh, they can be solved uh, once the pages are available in the newer locations. Or we actually solve the request or uh, we actually address the request from the wait queue as soon as a page is brought up into the hot and cold buffers or uh, temporary buffers, which is which is near the migration controller. And it also has some migration logic that can uh, track the behavior of the migration dynamically and 
try to control the frequency of the migration uh, based on the previous uh, observed behavior of the migration. And the migration queues, uh, these are the queues that store the migration requests in the migration controller besides uh, the regular read and write queue so that uh, the migration requests can be separated from the traditional read and write queues. Now, when we look at the address reconciliation process, uh, there are multiple steps in address reconciliation. So the idea of address reconciliation is once we migrate the pages from faster memory to slower memory, or slower memory to faster memory, we need to keep, uh, we can keep track of the migrated pages in the remap table for a certain amount of time because our remap table is pretty small. After, after a while, we need to let the operating system know that the pages have been migrated so that the operating system can update the page table entries uh, with the right frame addresses. So the process of reconciliation involves uh, the process of flushing the TLB entries with the old, uh, old physical addresses. And it also tries to invalidate the cache lines. The migration controller takes care of the sending the uh, inval invalidating cache lines and flushing the TLB entries. And the migration controller also initiates an interrupt uh, to the CPU so that the interrupt handler takes care of calling the uh, operating system uh, reverse map function so that it can track the physical address to the virtual address so that it can track the page table entries to uh, adjust or update it with the newer physical frame address. I'll briefly go through the uh, steps of the migration. Even though this uh, the process of migration is not the actual contribution of this work, uh, just to uh, explain the background, I'll briefly go through the process of migration. So we try to identify a hot page from a slower memory uh, from the access based on the number of access in the access counter cache. So I would like to explain the terminology's hot subpage. What's hot subpage indicates is if a page has received certain amount of accesses, certain amount of demand accesses based on our threshold range, uh, we classify a specific page to be hot so that, so that if we can migrate that page to a faster memory, we can uh, serve the page faster. And migration cutter also uh, instructs the operating system not to replace or reclaim this uh, frame for that period of migration and address reconciliation so that uh, we don't lose the page in the process of migration. And it also creates an entry in the remap table with the huge page address and also sub page bits so that we can track the number of sub pages that are being migrated. And uh, the idea of storing bit vector of sub page IDs will be useful uh, in the process of address reconciliation. In the next step, uh, migration control starts reading the sub pages onto the on chip hot and cold buffers from from the both uh, slow memory and fast memory. So you, so the idea of migrating cold and hot pages is is something called we call two-way migration. Uh, in case of when we are trying to migrate a hot memory or hot page to a faster memory, and if we don't have enough free frames in the HPM, we try to find a least recently used page and we assume that page to be a cold page and migrate the cold page to the slow memory and a hot page to the uh, fast memory. We kind of swap uh, hot and cold pages. So, sir, we have one minute, okay? Oh, what's that? We have one minute. This oh, is... okay. Uh, I'll try to quickly, quickly go through it. 
And in the next step, uh, migration control starts, once it reads the request or the pages into the temporary buffers, it starts to write those requests into the respective locations. And once the migrations, migrations are complete, uh, any future requests will be directed to the new location through the remap table. So the subpage migration with address reconciliation. So we migrate the subpages at subpage level granularity rather than the whole huge page. And we will only reconcile the pages only if all the subpages are migrated to the fast memory. Because since the operating system tracks the uh, page pages or page uh, page tables at the huge page level, it doesn't really know it what the subpage really is. So Reconciliation can be done only if all the subpages have been migrated. And this is the overhead. So uh, for example, uh, there, there is an application uh, that has huge pages, only 50 or 60% of the page is being heavily accessed. So in order for it, that page to be reconciled, we need to migrate the entire subpage and then reconcile. So migrating of the rest of the subpages is still not really giving any benefit. So we thought of a different approach of subpage migration with reverse migration, where migrations are still done at subpage level granularity, but as the remap table fills up, we try to find a page inside the remap table that's least recently useful, or that's uh, not really the Less, less useful and reverse migrate the page back to the original location so that we can have more entries in the remap table. Let's look at the configurations. We'll, for the workloads we tested, we use uh, spread uh, CPU workloads. The footprints of the applications are twice as large as the HPM size we used. And we collected the traces using ping tools and on a high level, uh, we use a trace-driven simulator, and these are the configurations uh, of the simulator we looked into. Uh, we also uh, briefly categorized, uh, I don't know, in the interest of time, we'll try to uh, quickly wrap it up, but the we try to categorize the application based on how friendly the application is and or how unfriendly is the application uh, based on the access behavior of the application. So this could be this will be useful in uh, in deciding whether an application would be beneficial or not. Beneficial migrating or not, I'm sorry. So if you look at the results on the x-axis of the workloads and the y-axis, the percentage of improvement, and the three bars we represent, uh, the first bar is huge page migration, and the second two bars are the Subpage migrations. So we need to look. Uh, we assume the subpage to be 64 kilobytes. That is the optimal one we found out based on our uh, testing of different subpage sizes. But dynamic change of the subpage uh, in runtime can be helpful. That's what we assume, but that can be tested uh, something in future, I guess. But uh, on average, uh, so, so the baseline is the no migration. So in, in the applications which have shown that uh, suffering with internal fragmentation, such as mix one, mix two, and mix four, mix five, and also MCO, in these specific applications, we observe this subpage migration to be a little more beneficial than the traditional huge page migration. So, uh, we didn't really observe the subpage to be doing better than a uh, huge page migration in workload MCF. I think one of the reason uh, this could is MCF constitutes only 3% of the pages that contribute to over 80% of the accesses. So only 3% of the pages contributing to 80% of the accesses. And if you can migrate all of 3% of those pages into the fast memory, uh, we can address the most of the pages that are receiving most of the most amount of the accesses. So that could be one reason uh, we are not really seeing subpaging doing better. 
Uh, so Shang, sorry, I, I need to ask you to jump to the closing. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to wrap up. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. So, uh, so subpage migration in the did perform better in the workloads where it suffers with the internal fragmentation, but uh, especially subpage migration with address reconstruction is doing better compared to reverse migration because when we reverse migrate, uh, we are losing, uh, we are migrating the hot pages to the cold page and we are using, losing potential uh, useful accesses with the reverse migration. But in future, we would like to combine a technique of both address reconciliation and reverse migration into one technique so that there can be a hybrid approach and also include a technique that can dynamically change the subpage size uh, based on the application behavior. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that would be the end of uh, the presentation. Sorry for taking more time, but. Uh, no, no problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I appreciate so any questions. Yeah, so I, I suggest that since we are already a bit behind the schedule, I suggest just that we postpone the, the questions and answers of this talk to the last uh, discussion panel. So we, we should go now, we'll go now for a break, for the coffee break. Since we are slightly um, uh, late, I suggest that we start the next session five minutes after. So we start at 6.20 um, for those that are in Europe. Okay. Um, so see you soon. Thanks. Uh, you. Sorry for <laughs> being late, but thanks.
it operates uh, at the level of um, the uh, hardware, the, the caches. So the, the, well, it is transparent for, for the programmer. Programmer doesn't need to know how it is implemented. Say you have these two threads running on different cores, they try to access the same shared item. If the conflict detection mechanism detects the conflict, it will just abort one of these transactions and restart it later. Uh, on the persistent memory side, as the previous talks have presented uh, multiple times, is this novel uh, memory with some uh, differences from DRAM at the, uh, from the point of view of performance. Uh, it, it allows us to write directly to the memory location. And if you have a power outage, the, the memory is persistent. However, we still have these volatile memories in between the persistent memory and the, the CPUs, namely the, the caches. And these are volatile. And in order to bypass the caches, the programmers need to use a CLWB instruction or CL flush. There are a bunch of instructions to, to um, achieve this, but one must proceed with, uh, with caution because the caches are volatile. If there is a uh, power outage, uh, in order to be sure things are uh, persisted, one must call these, these instructions. So how do we combine HTM and uh, hardware transactional memory and persistent memory. Uh, say, for instance, you have this uh, example where you start an hardware transaction, you write some item, in this case A and B, and then you need this uh, transaction to be both atomic and durable at the moment of commit. You may try to use these instructions inside the hardware transaction, flushing the data items. However, if you try that because you are externalizing data outside the caches and the caches are used by the other transactional memory to uh, isolate the modifications of the transaction. If you do that, the transaction aborts. So in order to combine these two technologies, HTM and PM, uh, there are uh, solutions that do so, but we need to go around this problem somehow. Uh, in this talk, I will focus on this Shamdol memory approach. Uh, so it is SPHT work. We have, uh, 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 have we have this survey that was uh, very recently accepted, uh, and we in that survey we explain these different solutions and, and more. I'll have a, a, um, a reference in the end of the of the presentation. Um, so let's see this uh, mechanism of combining HTM and PM using this uh, shadow memory approach. The idea here is to keep the stable data in the persistent tip, which is the persistent memory storage device. And then we have an unstable data, which is, the, we call it the volatile working snapshot. This is the data where the hardware transactions are working. And so they work here. Uh, they create uh, these logs and these logs are after the transaction commits, they are uh, flushed into the, um, the persistent memory, into persistent memory. Uh, these logs are used by this log replayer, which is a background uh, process that repeats all the modifications that the transactional memory did on the main, the working process. And then it applies on the persistent tip, which will eventually have the same uh, state as the volatile working snapshot. If there is a crash, we recover by mapping back the persistent tip into the vol volatile working snapshot. We can use tricks like copy on, on write in order to avoid duplicating the entire uh, persistent tip. And this is the, the sort of system that we see in DUTM, CCHTM, NVHTM, and this talk also SPHT. Uh, now, uh, these kind of uh, systems, so persistent transactional memory systems, we um, need to define some durability semantics for them. And in this work, we'll focus on immediate durability. It, it is similar to what we see in databases. So we have a transaction, we commit your transaction in the database. If it returns, okay, the transaction is committed. Uh, the programmer expects the transaction to be actually committed. And um, uh, the idea here in persistent transactional memory using this SPHT system is the same. We want the application to call our module, uh, it starts a transaction, and then when the module returns, I committed your transaction, the, the application expects the transaction to be durable. This also implies that you have this transaction T, 
if t depends on some other pre previous transactions, those transactions also need to be durable. Else you can have, uh, when you recover, you can have a consistency problem. Um, so let's look at the state of the art. Uh, we propose SPHT because we have uh, found uh, uh, limitations in the state of the art. There are these two levels of limitations. The first one is uh, limitations at the level of transaction processing, and then we have limitations at the level of the log replay. And at the level of the transaction processing, uh, some limitations, uh, are, these three limitations are so uh, some solutions use a global counter to keep track of the um, transaction order. This causes aborts at the hardware transaction level. Um, then some solutions extend the transactional window. In case of Crafty, they divide the transaction in two. They do a bit of work inside the hardware transactional memory context. Then they need to do some work to stabilize the logs. Then they need to restart the transaction. And some works also impo impose this uh, sequential mechanism that we'll see in the, in the, the next slide to ensure durability. Uh, of course, there is a possibility to relax durability instead of having immediate durability could have something relaxed and it would speed up your performance. There are other problems associated with that. Uh, and then on the level of the log replay, the works that we have seen so far most of them, uh, they have uh, this basic. They have a basic uh, replayer which just goes over all the writes that are in the logs, and we with SPHT we we improved that uh, that design. So SPHT we uh, removed all these limitations. Uh, with this work, uh, our main contributions are first these designs that I'm presenting here they uh, were evaluated using uh, emulated uh, persistent memory. In emulated persistent memory, they basically have DRAM and then inject uh, 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 latencies. And we found that it could be useful to check whether these designs uh, work on existing artwork. And then a second contribution is this novel commit logic and log replay technique that aims to uh, give SPHT its high scalability, as I will show in the in the results. Uh, so let's look first uh, to NVHTM. We the, our starting point for SPHT is exactly this NVHTM. I'll here in this slide show the problem that he has and how we solve the, this problem. So uh, imagine we have these four transactions. They start the executing HTM. And before returning, uh, exiting HTM, they gather a physical timestamp. You can get this uh, cheap physical timestamp from current architectures. There is this timestamp counter uh, in the x86 architecture. Uh, it does not cause the transaction to abort. It's a register that is synchronized among the different cores. And then they have this physical clock that basically tells the transactions uh, the, their uh, order uh, during the execution of HTM. The, afterwards, they uh, okay, they uh, exit the, the HTM transaction. They then flush their logs with the modifications, all the writes. And um, in, this, in this example, T0 can tell the background process, the log replayer, uh, that it is stable. However, T1, T2, T3, they basically check their surroundings. They see, okay, there is a transaction with a smaller timestamp than our uh, timestamp. We need to be careful. We cannot uh, flash right away this marker that tells the log replayer to replay my log. Because if we do so, and because in hardware transaction memory, we do not track the resets of the, the transactions, we don't know if we may conflict or not with T0. So in order to what the NVHTM and also in SPHT we do is we assume the previous transaction may uh, have written something that we read. And what we do in NVHTM is we wait the uh, T0 to make the commit marker uh, persistence. So does T1, T2, and T3. And as you see, this has this seri uh, serial path of execution after the execution of the HTM transaction. And with the SPHT, we follow this uh, simple strategy. So we have this batch of transactions. What we do is basically uh, look at to this as a batch, T3 could handle uh, the commit marker for the entire batch. And what it does 
is it's uh, okay, it knows there are other transactions around, uh, it uh, gathers that state and then it updates the global marker. T0 and T1 also know there is a uh, transaction T3 around, they wait for the global marker, they cannot advance before uh, they know the, the logs up to T3 will be replayed, so they wait the global marker and uh, to be updated to a value larger than their own timestamp. Uh, there could be some uh, uh, conflicts on updating the global marker. We just use this comparant swap primitive uh, to um, put there the most recent transaction uh, in, that, uh, in that global marker. Um, besides this commit um, uh, logic, we have also uh, a log replay uh, improvements uh, regarding the state of the art. Uh, so the log replay for this kind of solutions is important because it prunes uh, space, uh, the log uh, and uh, it frees log space for transactions to execute more transactions and produce more logs. It's also important for in the system availability point of view, if you have this power outage uh, and you need to restart your services, you need it to be as fast as possible. So if you have a fast log replay, it also helps you in improving the availability of the system. And in this work, we looked into these four different topics. We uh, have this uh, structure in the log that improves the, um, the replay of the log. Uh, we also looked into having a parallel log replayer. So we have all these resources available. We found that we could create a scalable log replayer, as I'll show in the, in the results. The idea is, here is uh, we share the persistent tip and then we have the multiple threads only replaying on the respective um, shards. We also looked into NUMA. So we have these different, uh, we have two, two sockets in our, in our testing machine. And the idea is to uh, put the thread uh, close to the to the memory. It also has a uh, it also improves the the replay speed. And uh, afterwards, we exploit this instruction right back in validate that basically uh, flushes the entire cache and it uh, allows us to not track the addresses that we are writing. So you just write the log until some point. We have a bunch of uh, addresses that need to be flushed. We just use this instruction and afterwards the, the cache is, is flushed. It's a bit heavier, uh, a lot heavier than uh, normal flush instructions, but because we have all, we need to replay all these logs, uh, it, pays, it pays off. In this uh, presentation, I will focus on the, the linked log approach. You can see more details on our publication. And the linked log approach, uh, so, uh, the idea here is to leave hints in, in the log. So the logs are distributed. We have one log per thread and uh, we can exploit the um, commit logic of the, um, of, uh, so our commit logic, you can see more details on, on, on the publication in order to pinpoint uh, either the predecessor or the successor um, in, the, in the log order. So basically, we, we need to know who is committing with us. So we need to look uh, 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 around us and we then can use that information. We find our timestamps, the, the closest timestamps to know whether there is some transaction that proceeds or succeeds us. Um, and now let me advance for the evaluation. Uh, in our evaluation, we have uh, this machine. It is composed uh, uh, with HTM and also uh, persistent memory. Uh, we have uh, up to 32 cores and 64 threads if we use the, the both sockets. And uh, we have 128 gigabytes of DRAM and 512 gigabytes of persistent memory. The solutions that we test here are the state of the art. And also in SPHT, we have the solution without linking with the where we detect the, the successor, so the forward linking, we call here forward linking, and the one where we detect the, the predecessor, the, we call it backward linking. And we tested in STAMP and TPCC. Uh, we, you can check out the, um, the code is in the link below. Uh, so let me advance here. Uh, I'll show a benchmark in STAMP, vacation low. 
we can see in the y axis throughputs and in the x axis with uh, number of threads. And the, in this uh, um, benchmark, uh, SPHT manages to scale up to uh, 64 threads. Uh, this is SPHT without the linking approach. This is with the linking approach. It imposes a little bit of overhead, but still uh, the solutions ma manage to, to, to scale. Uh, we noticed that other solutions bottleneck. In this case, it was around 1.5 mega transactions, millions of transactions per second. And uh, at the, the largest thread count, 64 threads, HVH, um, SPHT is better than NVH10 by 2.6x. Uh, then we uh, evaluated the log replay. In the log rep replay, we have the throughput the million in millions of writes per second in the y-axis and you have the number of threads of um, of the log replayer in the x-axis and as you can see by this plot we managed to make the log replayer scale up to around 16 threads uh, then we have these two variants the one that we show here as sort uh, is the one where the log replayer needs to actually go over all transactions and sort the transactions by transaction number, um, timestamp. And then you have the approach where we have the hints in the log and uh, basically the log replayer just needs to locate the hint for the next transaction and follow this, uh, this uh, link to log approach. Uh, then we have these two benchmarks, vacations, uh, the same as you see, uh, as you saw before in the previous slide and uh, also genome. In Genome, we have gains of uh, 2.1x by using the, the link approach and at 16 uh, threads with 16 replayers. And in Vacation Low, we have gains of 1.3x. Um, now I'll conclude with these two slides. Uh, first, the key takeaways. So um, HTM uh, have been around since 2013 from the Aswell architecture in Intel and uh, also Intel uh, released the persistent memory uh, in uh, April 2018. Uh, preceding persistent memory, the, the release of persistent memory, there were many solutions that tried to combine HTM and uh, PM. Uh, they proposed different designs for this problem. Uh, many of them do not, uh, or they focus on rela relaxing durability in order to have better perf performance. Uh, in our work, we focus on having this, uh, this criteria of immediate durability. And uh, uh, with SPHT, we believe we are, we are the first study that combined all these different designs in a, a commodity real hardware. Um, as I've shown you in the previous slides, the existing solutions have scalability limitations. During the transaction processing, SPHT, uh, which I showed you, uh, to have uh, better throughput. Uh, um, in this case, uh, the maximum was 2.6x at 64 threads um, by uh, exploiting this novel group commit uh, uh, approach. And in the log replay, I have shown you uh, that our log replay scheme uh, allows SPHT to scale up to 16 threads uh, having a speed up uh, up to 2.1x. Uh, and uh, though this is the, our current work. Uh, very recently, we have this survey accepted in the computing surveys. It explores um, not only HTM plus persistent memory, it also uh, explores other solutions, say using locks and uh, um, software transactional memory. Um, uh, so, in more in generally, uh, so failure atomic sections on top of persistent memory. Uh, then uh, uh, this uh, talk, SPHT, uh, was accepted in uh, FAST. Uh, a conference was last February. And uh, we also have this NVHTM work that was presented uh, at IPDPS and then extended for the Journal of Parallel and Distributed Computing. Uh, and thank you for listening. I'm open to questions now. And if you have some follow-up question, please send me an email. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, 
maybe I, I, I will warm up with, with the first question. Daniel, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, so you, you exploit heterogeneous memory because, because the working set, so the, what you call the shadow copy or the working set where you are actually processing your, your, your transactions, it, it is kept on a, on a copy in DRAM. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, if I understood correctly, your working set is assumed to fit in DRAM. And the question is, what if you have this application that has a huge data set and a huge working set and it no longer fits in DRAM? How, how do you think you could handle that okay. challenge? That's a tricky question. We actually in this uh, works and VHTM and uh, SPHT, what we do is we have this uh, argument. So when you map the, the, uh, the memory to DRAM, you do so using this private mapping. So when you try to write something in your, uh, in your memory, the operative system, what it does is, is it picks that, that memory page and then it copies on, on write to uh, DRAM. So it, you should have less memory on, on DRAM. But if you look for other works, say, uh, I think it's the Dudu TM. They have some uh, a bit more deep discussion there. They actually they try to see if a page is hot or cold, and then they try to retire the page to the uh, persistent uh, heap. But in this case, in SPHT and the NVHTM, what we do is very straightforward. We just map uh, shared the um, uh, persistent heap, and we can directly access the data that is in the persistent memory storage. And in the shadow memory in DRAM, if there is a modification, then the operating system will trigger a copy on write, and that's it. Okay, thanks. So, so follow, following up, so this means that there, there seems to be an opportunity uh, to employ you know the, the data placement techniques that we have discussed in the first session yes. to your to the shadow copy that these kind of approaches like like yours use. Do you agree? I agree, I agree. I think some of them could be used. I don't know how easily or how hard to, to do that, but yes, sure, it, sh it should be combined in this in this work, yeah. Okay, so if there is no no further question, uh, ah, okay, so Sudarshan, so raise your hand, so please go ahead. Uh, so uh, that was a good talk, and uh, one question I had was for the HTM, do you think there would be any application? So, uh, for example, there are a lot of libraries for persistent memory, right? Like PMDK and so on. Yes, uh, yes. I think for HTM, uh, there we probably require different application interfaces uh, because PMDK and others are generally built assuming that there is no HTM and there's just the regular persistent. Memory. So I'm curious. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I've, I've, I heard something. I think I, did, I didn't hear the last part of the question. So yeah, so my question is that uh, if we were to, let's say, use PMDK or something and uh, would we require like specific uh, better interfaces to also take into consideration there is a HTM support? Okay, so with PMDK, I think they have on their own um, concurrency control mechanism. Uh, I think we can call it an STM. If you want to put their HTM, yeah, there is some overheads there in their... Um, API that with HTM you probably do not want. I think you could try, and it should be not too hard to inject the HTM in the PMDK, but then you have all these overheads that, well, we incur just use by using this, this API. So I think, yes, if you want to use HTM, well, at least my own perspective, <laughs> I have been working with HTM for, for some time. Um, it is a bit trickier because you can do, you could do some accesses that you don't want and you are reducing the actual capacity for HTM. Among other problems, it could be accessing something that is global uh, shared and then you are causing some purity aborts that you could avoid. So yeah, I see that for HTM, you may want to use an, a different API, but I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I didn't work, I didn't try to actually in, inject HTM on say PMDK, on in, in, an interface like PMDK. But yeah, I see that the, the, the interface as is right now, it may introduce some overheads on, uh, on HTM that you don't want. I don't know if I answered your questions or not. Thanks. Uh, I, so uh, I in general, PMDK has like lot large number of 
rights correct and like uh, mm-hmm. there is a lot of additional overhead it's not just the data there is huge amount of additional overheads also so i'm just curious like what would be required to kind of adapt pmdk something like pmdk to hdms so i say can i didn't get your question it was a question <laughs> uh i know i think you answered my question okay uh, i just wanted to know like how easy it is to kind of take something like pmdk which is completely built for stm and like kind of then add htm specific interfaces mm. to see yeah. actually it's not easy to to answer that but, but yeah, yeah you, you can put it very very easily but then if you to work out <laughs> as you expect that's a different question okay. <laughs> no. yeah thank you mm-hmm. thanks so let, let's let's move on to the next talk but actually now we have two talks that are that focus on applications of heterogeneous memory systems and both applications are about machine learning. Um, so Daniel, can you please close your sharing screen? Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll give the, the floor to, um, to Guillermo, Guillermo Lore Talavera. I hope I, mean, I pronounced your name correctly, Guillermo. So Guillermo is a, is a junior uh, research engineer at uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And he's very interested in performance tuning for heterogeneous memory systems and deep learning frameworks and his talk will be about the combination of these two interests of him. Guillermo, please. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, as you all said, I'm Guillermo Iret Talavera. I work at BSC, in particular at the Accelerations and Communications for uh, HPC team. In this presentation, I will talk about uh, using Intel Obtain to perform inference in deep neural networks while applying homomorphic encryption to keep all the data private. I will start by giving a bit of uh, background about homomorphic encryption and Intel Obtain. In the last few years, uh, machine learning has become very popular. However, some users don't have the computational resources to process all their data. These users usually resort to cloud services. If the information they work with is uh, confidential or sensitive, they have to use one of the privacy preserving techniques. With traditional encryption, if you want to perform any operation, you need to decrypt the ciphertext, perform the operation, and encrypt it again. With homomorphic encryption, you can perform some, some operations directly on the ciphertext. To do that, you don't need the secret key, and the result will also be encrypted. This makes homomorphic encryption suitable for privacy-preserving machine learning. However, it has a drawback. It has an overhead between uh, 100 and 10,000 x in terms of memory uh, footprint and runtime. We have uh, studied the feasibility of using heterogeneous memory system to, <coughs> to solve this potential memory limitation. Uh, Intel Obtain DC are non-volatile byte addressable memory means. The main advantage of these DIMMs is the high uh, density. We have DIMMs of uh, 512 GB. Another important advantage is the power consumption, that is significantly lower than DRAM. But there are some drawbacks. The bandwidth is uh, three times lower uh, for reads and nine times lower for writes. And the latency is six times higher for reads and 30 times higher for, uh, for writes uh, when compared to DRAM. These specifications make Intel Obtain too slow by itself, but we can combine it with DRAM to get some performance while maintaining the high, cap- the high capacity of the system. The objectives of this research are the following ones. Uh, we want to analyze the memory requirement of two popular networks. We want to see the actual impact of applying homomorphic encryption on them. We also want to compare a traditional system that only uses DRAM with a hybrid memory system that uses both uh, DRAM and Obtain. We will also analyze the behavior and the access pattern of some of, of some of the functions that happen during inference in a deep neural network. And lastly, we want to check if this particular ap- application is suitable for Intel obtains in memory mode or not. Uh, now I'll show you the, the setup we have used for the experiments. We have a dual socket system with two Intel Xeon Platinum 8260L. Each of these processors has 24 cores. In each socket, we have two memory controller, uh, controllers. Each memory controller manages uh, three channels, and each channel has two possible slots. 
for the experiment, we have used two different configurations. The first one only uses four DIMMs of DRAM, which give us a total of, four, of 32 gigabytes, and uh, uses uh, 12 DIMMs of Obtain, which give us uh, 6 terabytes. The system is configured in memory mode. This means that the DRAM acts as a cache for, for the Intel Obtain. The DRAM is managed by the memory controller and is invisible for the operating system. The operating system only sees the pool of uh, Intel memory, Intel Obtain memory. In this configuration, the hardware prefetcher plays an important role because if the data is already on DRAM, it's uh, much faster. And the second configuration uh, only uses DRAM. It has uh, 12 DIMMs, which give us a total of 192 gigabytes. Uh, this configuration is used uh, for comparison purposes. If we, if we compare both configurations, we can see that the, <coughs> that the DRAM only configuration has uh, three times the bandwidth. This is basically because we are using uh, 12 teams instead of only four. Uh, in regards to the software, uh, we have used Intel Ngraph, which is a compiler and runtime that is compatible with uh, popular frameworks like TensorFlow or Onyx. It has several backends that run in different hardware platforms like CPU or GPUs from NVIDIA or AMD. The, the backend we have used, it's called uh, 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 HE Transformer. And this is the one that supports homomorphic encryption. It runs uh, completely on CPU and relies on the simple ar encrypted arithmetic library from Microsoft, also known as SIL. Uh, <coughs> this, uh, this backend uh, uses the CKKJ's encryption scheme. Uh, this scheme works with approximate arithmetic for real numbers and it supports encrypted uh, addition and multiplication. Most of the machine learning operations can be expressed in terms of only additions and multiplications. Regarding the models, we have uh, used uh, two popular ones that are uh, frequently used for computer vision tasks. Since we will focus on the inference part, not, not in the training, we will use the pre-trained models that are available online. Uh, MobileNet version 2 is intended to be used in devices uh, with less resources. Because of that, it has about nine times less computations than comparable uh, models. Another important feature is, is that it has two parameters that can be configured, the width multiplier and the input resolution. The width multiplier is the number of channels in each of the layers, and the input resolution is the size of the images in pixels. ResNet is a well-known uh, family of neural networks. We will use the variant that has 50 layers and receives images of 224 by 224 pixels. Previous to this research, uh, only some of the smaller models of MobileNet uh, were executed uh, while using homomorphic encryption. Thanks to Intel Obtain, we have been able to run all the variants of MobileNet and the complete uh, ResNet 50. I'll start, I'll start with the experiment of MobileNet version 2. Uh, we did some initial analysis with all the possible configurations. In the x-axis, uh, we can see the input resolution and the different lines uh, correspond to the different width multipliers. As we can see, uh, for the two highest uh, width multipliers, only the maximum resolution is available. In the first two plots, the y-axis is the accuracy. <coughs> and uh, we can see that it increases when we increase any of the two parameters, but this, uh, but this increase in accuracy comes at a cost, and the cost is uh, memory usage and also the runtime. The biggest model uh, needs uh, 1.2 terabytes of memory and uh, runs in almost uh, five hours, uh, which is a lot. But if we take a closer look at, at the memory plot, we can see that some of the smaller models uh, fit in the 
VRAM only configuration in 192 gigabytes. We have used uh, these models to perform a comparison between a uh, memory mode and the uh, and DRAM only. The this different is uh, is a, is a small, especially if we consider that the DRAM only configuration has uh, three times the bandwidth. Uh, this is a first indication that the <clears throat> that the HC transformer backend is performing efficiently on, on memory mode. But to confirm this, we need to do uh, some more analysis. The second uh, set of tools we have used are Extrae and Paraver. These two tools are open source and developed by the BSC. Extrae is used to generate the trace files, and Paraver is used uh, to visualize them. We also took advantage of one of the extract libraries that automatically instrument uh, the OpenMP runtime. OpenMP is the mechanism used by the HC transformer to perform the parallelization. We also added some custom events uh, to indicate the start and the end of some of the regions of interest. We captured uh, the hardware counters that were related to accesses to PIMEN uh, and DRAM. Uh, the local and remote uh, suffix uh, mean if the data we are trying to access is in the same socket or in the in the other socket. After all the experiments, we found that the accesses across uh, both sockets uh, uh, was balanced. So we decided to show you the following data uh, merging the two the two hardware counters. This is the data we got from these tools. Uh, the model we are showing you right now is the one that has a 0.75 width multiplier and a 96 pixel resolution. The reason for choosing this model and not another one is because with uh, bigger models, the trace file is so big that it's really difficult to work with. We have div divided the table in the main uh, machine learning functions. Uh, for the DRAM and obtain uh, accesses, uh, they are measured in thousands of, of, of loads. The most important function is convolution. This is the one that takes uh, most of the time by, by far. Uh, however, this function only accounts uh, for 40% of the obtained accesses. In fact, if we check the ratio, we can see that we only accesses obtained once every 59 accesses uh, to DRAM. This means that most of the time we are trying to get a value in during convolution, the value is already uh, is already there in the cache. On the other hand, uh, we have bounded relu. This operation is the one that uh, uh, takes most of the obtained accesses. These opt-in accesses are slow, but even though uh, the time for this function is less than 44% uh, of the uh, whole execution. This operation is also not supported, and it turns out that this is the cause of the high number of accesses. Unsupported operations are operations that cannot be expressed in terms of uh, additions and multiplications. What we need to do in these cases is send the data uh, back to the data owner, who is the person that has the secret key, and he's able to decrypt it, perform the operation, encrypt the result, and send it back to the server. But in our setup, everything happens in the same server. We analyze the decrypt and encrypt algorithm, uh, and the access pattern that these algorithms use is non-sequential, which is the cause of the high number of accesses to obtain. And the last tool we have used is Intel Bitium Platform Profiler. Uh, this tool doesn't monitor specific functions like Stray does. Instead, it, periodic it periodically collects system-wide uh, hardware counters. This approach has the advantage that the trace files that are generated are smaller, and therefore we can profile longer executions. Uh, 
We will show you the same model, the width multiplier 075 and the 96 uh, resolution. Uh, the reason to do that is because it's the one we use in the uh, previous slides, but uh, <clears throat> the bigger models uh, look identical. In these two plots, we can see the DRAM and Optane traffic in one of the two sockets. As I mentioned earlier, uh, both sockets uh, are balanced, so the plot that is not shown here uh, looks uh, very similar. Uh, we can clearly uh, distinguish uh, two phases, the initialization and the inference. We will focus on the inference, that is the one that has the function I, I showed you in the pre previous table. And uh, one of the reasons is that in a real scenario, you only need to perform the initialization once, and then you can perform as many inference as you want. From this plot, we can see that the memory is not the bottleneck in this execution. Uh, in the case of, of obtain, we can see peaks of uh, 4 GB for reads and around 3 GB for writes. These values are not even close to the bandwidth of, of the socket. Another interesting metric that we have with this tool is the hit ratio of the media prefetch buffer. The CPU uh, requests data uh, to obtain in chunks of 64 bytes, but each obtained in has a media prefetch buffer of uh, 256 bytes. If the data we are trying to access is in this buffer, is almost as fast as if it were in DRAM. In a sequential access pattern, we would expect a hit ratio of 0 0.75. The reason for that is that every miss would be followed by uh, three hits. If we take a look at the plot, we can see that once the inference starts, uh, we are really close to this 0 0.75 value. This means that most of the time we are using a sequential access pattern. This access pattern is uh, good for the cache mechanism, but also for the hardware prefetcher. Uh, now I'll, I'll move to the ResNet50 experiment. Uh, we have been able to run this model for the first time, but profiling it has been very difficult uh, due to the duration of the executions. The most useful dat data we have been able to get is the CPU usage and memory usage over time. The whole execution uh, lasts uh, 64 hours hours, which is almost two days and a half. Uh, in terms of CPU, we can see an alternation between and in terms of memory, the result was quite surprising for us. Even though this model is uh, more computational demanding, than a mobile net version 2, the memory requirement is in fact uh, lower. This model uh, doesn't even reach the terabyte. Uh, although we haven't been able to get uh, more data, we analyze this model and the convolution is also the, most, the more predominant function. Because of that, we expect a similar behavior in terms of memory access. The convolution access pattern doesn't change when we change the input size. Uh, the only thing that is affected is the number of computation uh, needed to finish. As a conclusion, uh, thanks to Intel Obtain, we have been able to run for the, for the first time some uh, big uh, deep neural network models. All of, all of the analysis uh, with the different tools point in the same direction that the HC transformer backend is using a, an access pattern that is efficient for, for the memory mode of Intel Obtain. This access pattern is most of the time uh, sequential, uh, and that means that it's not only good for the cache mechanism, but also for the hardware prefetcher. If you want to know more about this, uh, you can check our paper uh, that was published in the Transactions on Computers Journal a couple of uh, months ago.
and if you have any question, uh, please let me know. Thank you so much for the great talk, Guillermo. Um, if anybody has any question, please raise your hand. I can start with, with a question. So it's, this is just something that I did not understand and that I did not follow. Did you, did you, did you, did you change anything substantial in the DNN framework to run this, this experiment? Uh, in which framework? Sorry. So, so in. in to run these experiments, your your DNN models did, did you have did you did you change anything or you just ran them directly on? No, we ran them directly. Yeah. I see. And follow up. Uh, do you, from your findings, do you did you find any opportunity for changing or redesigning the the software so that you could get even better results? Uh, in terms of memory, no, because what we found is that the software was very compute bound. So, yeah, the the bottleneck was the 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 processor, not the memory. Okay. Thanks. So, if there is no further question, I think we can move on to the next to, to the last talk before our discussion discussion panel uh, it is a it is a pleasure to introduce uh, sorry to introduce professor dong dong lee so dong lee is an associate professor at the university of california merced uh, and the core theme of his research is to study how to enable scalable and efficient execution of enterprise and scientific applications on increasingly complex large scale parallel systems and in today he'll he'll tell us about um, efficient billion point nearest neighbor search on heterogeneous memory. Okay, Dong, I see you are there already. Okay, so you can you can take the, the floor. Thanks. All right, thank you, thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure to present our recent work about heterogeneous memory. Um, so I'm trying to find my pointer. Uh, okay, never mind. Um, so today I'm going to discuss a very specific application called uh, billion point nearest neighbor search. And uh, this application is very interest, interesting. Uh, traditional, the traditional profiling guided uh, optimization on heterogeneous memory is not going to work well. well. Um, now let's see the story. And by the way, this work is published in Neural Reefs last year, and this is a collaboration work uh, um, with uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, so some background knowledge. Uh, what is the approximate nearest neighbor search? So this algorithm is a very important algorithm. It has been widely used in image retrieval and document retrieval. This algorithm actually is a core algorithm in many search engines. And this algorithm is so important and common such that people are willing to change algorithms for high performance. So um, this algorithm in searching, this approximate nearest neighbor search in handling large, large scale and, and, and uh, uh, billions of data points is a very challenge. In that setting, usually you have uh, a, a lot of data points and each data point is a high dimensional. It's high dimensional and you can have hundreds of dimensions. That basically means each data point has hundreds of, hundreds of uh, floating point numbers. And uh, you want to search something within billions of data points and uh, billions of data points easily consume multiple terabytes of storage space. Okay, that's a lot of memory, a lot, lot of storage space. And uh, this search has two phases. The first phase is called indexing. Basically, in that phase, in that phase, you organize data in some special structures such that when the online search happens, the search can happen very efficiently. Okay, and so indexing happens offline, and the search happens online. During the online search, the user give you a query, give you a query, and then the algorithm calculate the distance between the query point and the data points, and then the algorithm returns k nearest neighbor, 
where k is the positive integer. So this is a basic uh, workflow of this algorithm. And uh, there are a couple of there are a couple of approximate, approximate nearest neighbor search algorithm. Um, as uh, uh, several of them are using a graph based method. This is state of art method as well. Uh, basically, using this method, using this method, all the data, all the data points are organized as a navi navigable graph. And then when, when search happens, when search happens, uh, by the way, in a graph, the graph nodes are data points. And the connection between nodes represent the close, uh, represent the neighborhood between those nodes. And then at the runtime, when users send a query, the search will start from random point in the graph. And then the search find the nearest neighbor based on the connection in the navigable graph. And during the graph traverse process, we are using a greedy algorithm trying to, uh, trying to find the nearest neighbors during the traverse, graph traverse. And this is the basic idea of this graph based method. And uh, HNSW, or hierarchical navigable small word algorithm, is a representative state of art approximate neighbor search algorithm based on the graph based method. And this uh, HNSW algorithm build a hierarchical graph with the multiple layers, with the multiple layers. And the, uh, the bottom layer of this graph include all the data points, all the data points. And then the upper layers are randomly selected and the nested subset of all data points. Okay. And then with HNSW, the search start from the top layer, the search start from top layer. And in the top layer, we try to find the nearest neighbor in that layer, and then use that point as the entry point to go to the search in the second lower layer. Okay, and then in the latter layer, we start to search another nearest neighbor, and then from there, we go to the next level uh, lower la layer. Okay, so basic idea is through this hierarchical search, we gradually narrow down the search scope in the bottom layer, such that when, we, when the search reaches the bottom layer, we don't have to search a lot of points to find the nearest neighbor. Okay, so this is a, this is the basic idea of HNSW. HNSW is a, a highly is a highly efficient. This structure works pretty well for many real world data sets, uh, and it has been used in search engines. It can give you high recall or high accuracy, search accuracy, and low latency. But the problem is when you use those graph-based method, or especially HNSW, to handle this high-dimensional large data sites, um, you will have a, a fundamental limitation. Limitation because the limitation comes from the memory consumption. In order to make these algorithm works, you have to put all the data points in main memory because you want to minimize the query latency. And if you are searching millions, billions of data points, you will consume terabytes scale memory. Okay, if you are using DRAM, that's a lot of DRAM consumption. And uh, that's a lot, lot of a production cost, and, and, and uh, people don't want to use it. So to solve this problem, people introduce the compression-based method. Basically, with this approach, people compress the data points such that those data points can be fit into memory. And then they cluster the data points, cluster compressed data points in memory, and then search the closest cluster to the query. So this algorithm is pretty good because it has a small DRAM consumption, but it has a low recall because the data compression loses information. And if you search based on the compressed data, basically you have inaccurate search results. And also the compression can introduce some high latency. Okay, so this is a problem. And the recent program use, uh, near, uh, use uh, nearest neighbor search plus SSD to address this problem. The basic idea is, they maintain two copies of the data, and one copy is in compressed representation in main memory, so we don't have a large DRAM consumption. And another copy is placed into the SSD, and that copy is in full precision, no compression, okay? And then search happens in main memory using compressed data, 
And once we get the search result, we re-rank the search result using full precision points stored on SSD. Um, the beauty of this method is that it's highly, it's highly is highly data, uh, it's highly DRAM friendly because, uh, uh, because it uh, does not consume a lot of space. And uh, uh, sorry for the interruption. <laughs> and uh, also, it has a high recall because you are using full precision points stored on SSD to correct the incorrect certain result. Uh, collected from um, uh, uh, main memory. But, uh, but the problem is that uh, SSD is slow and uh, you will have a high query latency. So this brings us a problem. Can we, get, can we get high recall, low latency, and a low DRAM consumption? And the answer is yes. Actually, we, ha we have the emerging, emerging heterogeneous memory and heterogeneous memory provide a solution to do that. And we particularly focus on uh, interoperant DC percent memory plus DRAM as a heterogeneous memory. And uh, the permanent gap be between DRAM percent memory is obviously smaller than that between DRAM and the typical SSD. Okay, that basically means what? That basically means you can place some data points into percent memory without causing a, a very long query latency. And also because of the high performance of percent memory, you don't need to use a point compression. Okay, so that's pretty good. But hold on a little bit. You still need to take care of the, uh, the data placement in, in the heterogeneous memory because there's still a two to three times performance gap between the present memory and the DRAM. And also note, note here, the traditional preferring guided optimization will not work well, well in this case because the nearest neighbor search has random memory access pattern. It, and the reuse difference of those frequently accessed pages can be very long. So it's difficult to capture those hot pages if there's any hot pages. Okay, so we, got, we, we have to look for the algorithm innovation. We have to change the algorithms. But uh, luckily this algorithm, is, this uh, nearest neighbor search algorithm is so important. Uh, the people like Microsoft are willing to change the algorithm and use it in the production. Uh, so, that's here we come. We introduce a new algorithm uh, called HMANN. The basic idea of the algorithm is as follows. And uh, we map this hierarchical graph into heterogeneous memory. And uh, without, without surprise, the bottom layer or layer zero of the graph is placed into percent memory because that memory is large. And the bottom layer includes all the data points. And then the random and then the, select, the, the subset of the, the, the data points is placed into DRAM as the upper layers, as upper layers. And now the more fundamental question we want to answer is how to reduce the number of memory access in the bottom layers or in present memory such that the query latency can be minimized. Okay, this is a problem we want to address. Our basic idea is that we build a very, very high quality upper layers. As a result, most memory access happens in fast memory, and we don't need to search a lot in the percent memory. Um, and uh, our algorithm, which is called HMAN, actually takes both memory and data heterogeneity into consideration. And that basically means we place those data critical to the search quality into the upper levels. We distinguish the data contribution to the search results. And that allows us to enable billion scale similarity search on single GPU node without using compression. And now let's look at our algorithm in more details. Um, we'll start from indexing phase. Okay, we start from indexing phase. So during the indexing, we build, we still build a graph incrementally to build a hierarchical graph. Basically, we search the layers from top uh, up down to the uh, down to the, the lay, uh, uh, bottom. And this is, uh, indexing algorithm is similar to the existing HNSW algorithm. And using this algorithm, we can build a very high quality bottom layer, so high quality bottom layer, because in bottom layers, those nodes who, has, who are close to each other are have, have connection. So we have some, we, we, have, we embed some information into the bottom, bottom layer. Um, and after that, 
we are going to sort all nodes, sort all nodes in the bottom layer based on their degrees. And then we delete all the upper layers, all the upper layers. And then we are going to populate upper layers. During the population process, we promote the highest degree nodes from bottom layer to the upper layers. In this case, we promote from R0 to R1. A number of nodes in R1 is constrained by the fast memory size. We continue to do so for other upper layers as well with a constant promotion rate. Again, the promotion is going to be constrained by the fast memory size. Here you can see that we promote the nodes with the highest degree. Because the nodes with the highest degree is has a very uh, give you a lot of information on, uh, on uh, to guide the, the, the search process, and you have to go through these highest degree nodes, you have a better chance to find the nearest neighbor search. So, using this promotion approach, you basically improve the quality of the upper layers. And uh, so, this is indexing. After indexing, we are going to do the search online search. Now let's say as a user, you give me a query point and I want to search. The search will start from the top layer again. And then search, we will use a greedy search from the top layer down to the uh, R2 layer. R2 layer is the third last layer in your graph. And uh, in the R2, you find, you, you find an entry point in R1, which is the second last layer. And this uh, finding this entry point is based on a greedy search again. But the, the magic thing that happens in R1, in R1. When you search in R1, you will try to find the multiple near, nearest neighbor candidates instead of just one. In the traditional algorithm, you just find the one nearest neighbor candidate and then use that as entry point to go into the bottom layer. But here we want to find the multiple entry points. And then we use the multiple entry points to go into the bottom layer to start a search. And each entry point lead to one search. So having multiple entry points basically means you have multiple searches happen in parallel. And using these multiple entry points, you are, we, we collect the nearest neighbor candidates from those multiple entry points search without, uh, uh, so, so that we can improve the search quality without increasing the search time, without increasing the search time. And also note that the upper level already have very high quality nodes. As a result, when we reach the R0, when we reach the bottom layer, the entry point is already has a, is already very close to the nearest to the to the query point, so that we don't need to spend a lot of searches in the uh, bottom layer. Okay, so that's the basic algorithm of our uh, uh, HM AN. And uh, let's see some evaluation results. In our evaluation, we use a heterogeneous memory system with this 96 gigabyte fast memory and 1.5 terabyte uh, of 10. And uh, we evaluate uh, multiple billion scale data points. And the we use two evaluation metrics. The first is the query response time. The second is the accuracy with the top K recall. This basically measure the fraction of the top K retrieved by the nearest neighbor algorithm that are exact nearest neighbors. And K is chosen as either one or 100 in our evaluation. And then we also compare HM, HM ANN with two speeding scale compression-based method and the two graph-based method called HNSW and NSG. And now, now let's look at the results. We first will show you the query time versus top K recall. In this slide, we have two figures. The left figure is for top 100 recall and the right figure is for top one recall. And uh, we have five curves corresponding to five evaluation cases. And our algorithm is uh, blue curves shown in the figure. And we can see that if you look at, if you fix the query time, let's say you fix the query time as uh, four micro, uh, milliseconds, you will see that the HM ANN always has the best, best accuracy. Uh, but if we, uh, fixed, if we fix the accuracy, let's say we fixed accuracy as 0 0.9, we can see that the, our algorithm is always 
um, uh, is always faster than the existing algorithm. Actually, we have uh, the HMAN is about two times faster than the graph-based method to reach the same accuracy. And we also compare our algorithm with system-level solutions. Uh, with the system level solutions, this is system level solutions, including the memory mode in our 10, which basically, which basically use DRAM as a hardware managed cache for percent memory. It also compared with the new first touch uh, and uh, uh, slow memory only. Slow memory only basically means you put everything into the percent memory without using DRAM. And this figure shows the accuracy and the query time. And here we can see that the HMAN outperform the memory mode and the first touch NUMA by two times and 3.7 times respectively in terms of accuracy time. We are achieving the same accuracy. And such impressive performance, uh, performance improvement come from the fact that the HMAN manage data based on algorithm knowledge, where the system solution is uh, a application agonistic solution. They don't know the, 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 the details of those uh, uh, data heterogeneity and uh, how important the data is to the uh, uh, query. So in conclusion, uh, in this story, I'm trying, trying to, in this talk, I'm trying to tell you a story that by releasing, if you're releasing full power of uh, the heterogeneous memory sometimes requires a co-design of algorithm and the system. In this morning, uh, Sudashen mentioned the importance of a co-design uh, hardware and uh, system here, I also want to mention that the co-design of algorithm and system. And especially if the algorithm is very important for performance, people are willing, pay the, are willing to pay the cost of the restructured algorithm. And our algorithm called HMAN maps the hierarchical design of the graph-based AN to memory heterogeneity in heterogeneous memory. And also combined with the system level solutions such as a parallel search, we are able to avoid expensive excesses in slow memory without uh, sacrificing the accuracy. And uh, on two billion scale data sites, we are able to provide 95% to top one recall in less than one millisecond. It's a very impressive result. With that, uh, I conclude my talk and welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dong. Uh, let me congratulate you and your young assistant for your, the great talk. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any question. Please raise your hand. Well, I, I, I can, I can, I can start with the first question. So, I, I found it really interesting that in our program you, uh, you focus on algorithmic innovation as a way to exploit uh, the power of uh, heterogeneous memories. Um, you, you, you innovated the algorithm for your specific uh, application, uh, but from your work, did you, can you take any generic uh, insights or guidelines that, that could guide algorithm innovation for other algorithms from other domains? Yes, that's a very good question. That's also uh, our ongoing work. Actually, we are trying to generalize our solutions. We have been working on many applications. And um, we do find some common commonality when optimizing performance of those applications on heterogeneous memories. For example, the lifetime of data objects, for example, when should we trigger the, the migration? There's a lot, lot of commonality. I, I, do see, I do think there's uh, some way to, to make this generalized uh, you know, using a solution such as machine learning or domain specific language. We could, we could do that to make it more general. Okay. Uh, Tony, do you want to, to ask your question? Or maybe I... I, sure. I, I yes, I, I, uh, I, I forgot uh, we were speaking up now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, how specific is this approach for obtaining based uh, hybrid memory systems? Because it, it could apply uh, perhaps as uh, out of band or something like that, or maybe... More, yeah. 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 Um... Yeah, yeah, good question, Antonio. Actually, this uh, uh, approach is not specific to our plan. Uh, actually, it just, um, uh, it does not have any assumption on what's the underneath uh, heterogeneous memory should look like. As long as there are some problem difference between a fast memory and a slow memory, then this solution could be applied to them. Yeah. Thanks. 
Okay, so so uh, if there are no further questions for now, I think this is the perfect moment to start our discussion panel, and of course we can follow up any pending question from from the, the all the talks. Now. So I'll give the I'll give the 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 floor now to Petar. Petar, are you there? Hello, hello, hello. Hello. So, so, so here I am. I mean, it, it, it's great. We have small small audience here. I mean, you all fit to my screen. So, so we can really keep this interactive and, and, and we can just talk, I think. I mean, if, if, if the organizers have any complaints about how we do this, shout, right? <laughs> in a normal environment, you could try to give me some, you know, delicate sign, but in, in Zoom, just shout. <laughs> so, 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 so that's cool. So we have half an hour only and, and it's already late and it's Friday and, 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 and I, I would just uh, like to speak throw some things on all of us and, and to see what do you think. Right? Uh, the first question that they have actually, I, I will throw it to Dave, maybe, 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 but I mean, to all of you, but, but Dave, Dave told us about these three eras of memories, like memory, just a memory, memory is NUMA and memory is heterogeneous memory. So what is the fourth era of memory, Dave and everybody else? Right? And I have my favorite answer. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm not saying if my answer is correct, but I, I have a, a champion. So Dave is not here. Dave is faking. <laughs> Dave just connected and then he left his phone. So somebody else. So, I mean, so, uh, Harald, Harald, I see Harald in the corner. Harald, are you also faking? Oh no, you are, he unmuted. Uh, no, no I'm, I'm back to, to speak. Can you rephrase the question, please? So sorry. So, so we had like three. Three, three, they mentioned three eras of memory. Memory, mm -hmm. just plain memory, yeah. memory as NUMA, uh, yeah. memory as heterogeneous memory, uh, meaning um, different properties. NUMA means the same memory, just some is closer, some is farther away, like UPI, like, like different sockets mm -hmm. that you have at Intel. And, uh, and then heterogeneous memory, meaning different memory devices connected to the same CPU. And so my question is, what is the fourth era of memory or what is the next big thing or you don't know wow. because intel is a cpu company <laughs> <laughs> okay that that would be a good answer for me but honestly i i don't have a clue right now so yeah. uh, if i can pitch in i think there is a lot of currently focus on processing and memory kind of memory that was my champion thank you i mean i'm not like, cool <laughs> sorry uh, yeah so for example uh, samsung is currently introducing this uh, 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 it's called pcu in some other places they call it like simas essentially like uh, memory with the capability to perform operations inside the memory uh, uh, for example samsung's memory is specifically for doing some simple operations for machine learning, AI specific applications. Uh, it could do like simple uh, uh, addition and subtractions and other so on, so that you don't have to fetch the data all the way up to uh, your CPU or your accelerator. Uh, similarly, there is one more company called UPMEM, which is like kind of uh, also doing, but they are essentially like adding more uh, compute capability inside the memory and their their focus is not this ai application but general application so uh, i'm not sure if that's the fourth <laughs> uh, uh, dimension to this but it looks like there is like a lot of interest towards uh, in memory processing currently yeah that's a great comment um, I, I also have a comment uh, on top of that i think uh, memory with compatibility is definitely a trend and on top of that, we could uh, make a memory, memory more intelligent. That basically means the memory itself have some intelligence to decide uh, uh, how to support the computation. Um, uh, for example, uh, we have been collaborating with the Sandia, uh, uh, Sandia uh, no, sorry, Bim Wang National Lab. Uh, we are trying to use, um, the, the, we are trying to see whether the molecular dynamic simulation can efficiently use this large memory. And uh, one of the assumptions is that uh, uh, if the memory has some intelligence, maybe based on uh, machine learning or even some simple 
uh, uh, sorting algorithm, we could uh, uh, reuse the previous computation result, and, uh, and that has been uh, and decide whether we should keep the computation result instead of overwriting it, and then reuse the computation result in the following in the following computation. So that that way will significantly relieve the, pro, uh, uh, the processor from doing some repeated work, doing some redundant work, and so 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 I I, I would I would say that. Um, uh, in combination uh, with the capability of a processing in memory, we could uh, introduce some intelligence into the memory such that it can, it can help uh, the computation to be more efficient. Thank you, thank you. Joao, I mean, you. what is your opinion? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, I, can... I mean, you cannot hide just, just you know, as, as a moderator and, and, uh, and asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, of, so there is an obvious uh, item to, to add to the discussion, which is disaggregated memory, which I believe will play a very important role, especially in the domain of cloud computing. And I, I, I would also, also comment that today, when we think about heterogene, heterogeneous memory, we've, we tend to think about different technologies that have different performance behavior, so different performance um, characteristics. And we tend to forget about the functional functionality. Okay, for instance, just to give you an example that um, that we touched today. So we have been talking about uh, Optane. And we, when we think of Optane, we think of large capacity, lower memory consumption, uh, sorry, energy consumption, uh, lower speed. But we often forget that it also gives us persistence, which allows us to do something different than other volatile memory types. And usually today in literature, either you see papers that use heterogeneous memory for uh, volatile uh, processing, or you, they just you focus on uptime for persistency. And I think we still have some steps to do until a point where we use these different memory types for their different functionalities, okay? As such as in processing, um, uh, in memory processing or persistency together with volatile memory for something else. So functionally heterogeneous memory, in my, my perspective. Great, great. Tony, you're the next. Yeah, I was uh, going to mention as well disaggregated memory. It's not that I believe that will be next uh, because I was also a fan of disaggregated GPUs and they never came. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, not sure, but uh, let's see what happens. And I also share the view of, of Joao on, on the need for leveraging this uh, capability of, of persistency plus random access memory. How can we use both at the, at the time without uh, doing any redundancy, like preventing IO plus then using it uh, as, as load the store that, that's very little work on it and it's because it's fairly unclear how, how to use it that way that's so I mean, I mean I have to I have to uh, I have to tell you that one of the questions I, I like to ask people and, and maybe you're aware of that is do, do we use persistent memory for its persistency or for its capacity <laughs> and, and, and this is and actually, if we talk about persistent memories, we do have persistent memory that is not high capacity. It's STT MRAM, and nobody's using it. I mean, in HPC, right? So, so, so it's it's the per and persistency equals capacity is not always the case. So anyway, so so this is this is so 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 Dan Daniel or Daniel, sorry, uh, but, it, but it's, Peter, but Peter, that, Peter, that depends on who you ask, right? Definitely. So, I mean, so. We, you are mostly focused on HPC, but uh, the folks working on databases and the like. Who's Paul? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, exactly. Paul, Paul is my, this is internal joke. Paul is my office mate. So <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So this is. So it, it, it depends on kind of workload you're using. So uh, on places such as VSC that you are mostly investing on HPC, it's a difficult thing to exploit, but if you go, for instance, into SAP, for instance, they are pretty sure in using, uh, well, in this case, obtained for, for, for storage. And uh, for instance, we have DAOs, this operating system based on, on obtained that I don't know if maybe next year we could 
try to bring a folk, uh, explain them about DAOs, for instance. Yeah. So this is not, I mean, it's, I will tell you, I do not have, I mean, obviously the questions who you ask, I mean, it, it's, it is, uh, I mean, I just like to, to open this question and, and it's to see what, what different people say. And, and you're absolutely right that at least I'm brutally biased towards, towards HPC, but this is what I sort of try to understand. So cool. So Daniel Castro, I mean, let, let's not, <laughs> let's not keep him out. So, <laughs> so any comment, any opinion? on this of having capacity or persistency on memories. Or um, memory fourth era or memory 4.0 or whatever. I really don't is know that. if the fourth era will be putting processors on top of the, um, I would like to, to test it. If I, if these machines are available or will become available, I think in some paper, in fact, in 2019, I think there were some publications there that tackle that, uh, that issue also. And some works where they have this stacked uh, circuitry and some of those layers could be processing. But um, I've not seen anything commercial available. Maybe there is, and I don't know. But if it is, I would like to, uh, to use it. On my area of having transactions, I don't know if we can make use of it to do synchronization on the memory side. I really have no clue, but if it would be possible, it would be something that I would like to work on. Um, also, on this part of having large capacity versus persistency, <laughs> I really don't know. Uh, I think Ooh. that it's just the, just the fact that you have these big memories. I think the fact that they're persistent is secondary. You have big memories now, these workloads, especially neural networks, that you can fit them there. Uh, I think is more relevant than just having fast storage even though the PM is slightly well, slower than the RAM. Just the fact that you have, now you have your all your data or all your model available in my memory, it uh, improves the, it depends on application, but some applications, they have this big boost. Cool. So, so, so about atomics, I mean, what you mentioned, I think that you actually do have them it, in HBM already, or, or I mean, nice. the, the, they were playing with some atomics on the memory side. So also one comment about processing in memory, we were working on white paper in, in Europe. I was, I was one of the people working on it about all the different flavors of processing in memory and all the uh, prototypes and pre-commercial products. And it's mad, it's mad. I mean, the white paper ended with like 50 something references and we haven't referenced a single academic work. So everything was uh, all printed chip or, 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 I mean, it, it, it was crazy. So, I mean, at some point I will share this with Tony and he might share it with you. But Upman or UPMEM or Samsung or, or, or Sony is putting that in, in image sensors where they, they put directly for image recognition, right? In, with processing in memory. And there are, there are so many different flavors that you can find. And about processing in memory as a technology that is proven, we already have it as uh, on die ECC where processing is integrated in, in the memory silicon and it does change our, I mean, it does do some computation. You cannot program it, it's there only for, for resilience, but it's there. So, so, so that's, that's, uh, that's about it. So uh, about, sorry, persistence or capacity, just comment on my side, this was just a side comment, so, so, so ignore it. Cool, thanks. So another question for you. And I have to tell you, it's Fujitsu ARM system, FX1000, HBM only. Good design, bad design. Uh, any thoughts? Well, for the purpose of this workshop, it is a bad design, right? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> let me see one. So, so do we have a comment from Intel about Fujitsu ARM design, it's and they say, oh, an it's a bad design, it's right? Not, oh. It's not oh. an Intel official comment. <laughs> yeah, this is. <laughs> <laughs> so so for see. the purpose of heterogeneity, I think that it's a bad design, uh, but I cannot claim anything with respect to performance. Uh, I have heard that it's good in some aspects and bad in others. So honestly, I don't have a clue. Uh, but I think it's a bit worrisome that we don't see more heterogeneity coming, despite we have different technologies, right? Um, 
Well, we can always discuss whether HPC is for running Limpack and maybe other benchmarks or some applications. But yeah, I would like to see some some machines like you folks have in at BSC. You not only have Mare Nostrum, which is the big machine, but you also have uh, a number of satellite clusters where you explore different technologies. Yes. So at, at, so at some point that will be necessary because the workloads do not fit into a single machine sometimes, right? So some workloads do not work on GPUs and you have to use CPUs. Some workloads fit perfectly on FPGA. So, well, you have to test them. Some workloads benefit from HBM, others don't. They prefer some uh, slower latency. So mm. to me, well, if they want to run Limpac and some other benchmarks, that's okay. But well, if they if most of their applications are like that, then, then it's okay. But otherwise, it's probably not right. But that's my personal opinion. No. Cool, cool. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Harald. No, so other comments about? I mean, I, I I don't know the answer, right? I mean, it's just throwing. So somebody, do, do we have a hand raised for from Dong, or it is high five? <laughs> <laughs> it's Andreas, actually, it's Andreas. actually, I have a quick comment here. I don't know. Um, the hard band, uh, hard band with me, uh, is a memory based system. Of cost, uh, what's the cost? You know, it could be very expensive as a result. You just cannot afford a very large memory, and it's not uh, going to be um, uh, affordable by every institution easily. And, um, and uh, and uh, if you don't have a large memory capacity per node, then you have to use a communication and you have to justify the overhead of, uh, uh, of using the overhead of using this communication to pay this smaller memory capacity for high performance. And uh, it's difficult to, uh, it's difficult uh, argument, it's difficult uh, trade off to, to explore, you know, either I use a uh, uh, high bandwidth memory for high um, memory performance locally, or I sh I, I, as, a, as a cost of an increase in the communication for high performance. So I, I think uh, it's, uh, the solution is interesting, but it's probably not affordable by many, many other peoples. Thank you. Thank you. Liu, high five to you. Now it's your turn. Yeah, that's, that's my yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I, I tried this, uh, this chip. Uh, at Oak Ridge, they have a test bed on that. And uh, uh, I think that uh, actually, um, uh, maybe this kind of something that get back to, to what Dave said, that is the, the first era about the, the NUMA problem. So actually all of the, this, the, the chip, they organize all of this HBM that's in, in the NUMA architecture. So this means that we, can, we have to go back again to investigate the NUMA, how to place the data. That's uh, that's in the. I mean, Numa means that all uh, they have the two Numa nodes, and the, the both Numa nodes, the controller, they control, they, they access the same type of the memory, but they have local access and the remote mm -hmm. access. So something like that, like that, and also that's given this high bandwidth. That's the this require more about the compilers. Like the uh, we really need to uh, efficiently use the uh, the the, uh, the vectorization unit uh, in the in the core. Actually, they provide this the the scalable vector extension. That is the yeah. SVE, which is the major advancement that's inside this chip. Yeah. So yeah, but I, I think that's this the this give pretty nice, um, uh, pretty nice performance. But definitely, that's we we really need to optimize the code to to get this performance out. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Shashank. You're the next. Yeah. So uh, I'm actually trying to think of the previous question, actually. Uh, DRAM, NUMA, heterogeneous memory, and then next what, next what? So based on the discussions we had, I was thinking of, so there are a couple of good points being made of processing in memory and accelerators. And with the introduction of CXL, we can probably have quick interconnect between uh, a heterogeneous memory and an accelerator, which contains its own memory. Uh, maybe another processing in memory in the same system. So there could be a heterogeneous of heterogeneous memories and different interconnects. Uh, yeah, 
I'm thinking of the future might be a system combination of heterogeneous memory and CXL and comprising of accelerators, which has its own processing in memory and maybe in its own memory. Yeah, I guess that's my take on it. Great, thanks, thanks. This would be great because it would mean that there would be a money flow to research for some time without <laughs> to use it. So that's yeah. that's. I hope it will happen, right? So 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 great, great. So I have one. I mean, something that that Harold said actually touched me, and this is like we are maybe going down on heterogeneity in memory. Because I mean, we talked about Kena. Uh, it died. No worry. I mean. Uh, then we move to Optane. Uh, Micron is out. Now Intel is the only company that is making Optane. Uh, we have this Fujitsu server, which is uh, just one, one memory tier, HBM. I'm not aware of any big announcements about heterogeneous memory systems connected to the CPU. I mean, we do have like CPU plus GPU, and then we have different memory systems there, but that's another story. So why? I mean, why, and are we going to have something? This is actually a very good question for Intel. I mean, and uh, because we have seen that there are a lot of ingredients we have on the table, right? We have all the memory companies now are doing HBM. They're all doing DDR4, DDR5. Uh, storage class memory, whatever is the, the commercial name is, is there, but where are heterogeneous memory systems? I think, I think uh, it probably comes down to the products, production costs and yield, I guess. So if we have to integrate HPM on, on chip, on die, uh, so we have to manufacture HPM and this manufacture CPU and solder it onto the same die that I think as far as uh, my experience, I think it's the yield issue. If we can uh, improve the yield of manufacturing HPM with uh, the processor on the same die, I think that probably can ramp up the production. Because I think I remember in 2015, AMD, AMD started producing GPUs with HPM on chip. But I think they discontinued it. I'm assuming it, it could be the issue re related to the yield. So I think it, it's more of a production issue rather than uh, technology, I guess. That's what I think at this moment. Great, thanks. Tony, high five. To me, an indicator of where things may continue, at least from Intel's side, is the, the efforts that they have put into the CXL or CLX, I never remember, sorry. <laughs> and on, uh, being able to directly interface with uh, persistent memory pools rather than just mm -hmm. going to them over uh, devices or processors or whatever. So that might be next steps of, let's say, heterogeneous memories and how they are interfaced. Uh, that's, that's my impression. It was a lot of effort to, to include that into the specs. Good. Anybody else? Anybody from industry could tell us? Oh, sorry, sorry. I see. I see. Joao, you, you're. Yeah, yeah. Uh, high five to you, Petra. Yeah, high five. I'm academic, so my, my opinion on this is uh, less important. But uh, let me just add that I think another um, another sign of you know the vitality of heterogeneous memory systems is what, uh, the adoption by you know large clients. So, and that's something that, that we still need to see, but uh, at, at least the, there is this big example of the Aurora Exascale uh, computer from US, which, which is supposed to be shipped with uh, uh, DRAM and Optane, as, and uh, as, far, as far as I know, they have not changed the plans. So once that happens, that will be, I, I think, a big change because you'll have, uh, it will impact a lot of users that will think about how to use that new uh, ecosystem. Also, uh, I, I would expect that in, if in, in the new, near future, if you see some big cloud provider that started offering 
you know, virtual instances with, for instance, DRAM and Optane, that would also be a big shift. So, so my point is, um, not just the the manufacturers need to to sell this. We also need to have, you know, big deployments available so that we can attract a lot of users. Then we get traction with new applications. Okay, before we get that, um, we are long. We are away from from our target. Okay. Great, thanks. Dong, you have one minute and then we have to close, sorry. No problem, no problem. I, I will try to be short. Uh, actually, um, I think that uh, besides those large scale machines, so we are also having those mobile devices. You, uh, it, typically, those mobile devices uh, have a big favor of this uh, hardware heterogeneity. Look at those mobile processors. They have uh, multiple processors, uh, heterogeneous processor already. And now they are starting using the heterogeneous memory. Uh, I, I think Xu has a previous work published in S Plus talking about this uh, heterogeneous memory in mobile device setting. I think uh, it's highly possible that the mobile device will become the pioneer to, to widely embrace this memory heterogeneity. So we could use that space as well. Thank yeah, you. Definitely. Great, great. I mean, this is really refreshing. I told you I'm, I'm, I'm brutally HPC biased. So, so that's, we have two minutes left until the top of the hour. I, I'm coming back the mic to the organizers. I mean, to, clo to close the session, I don't know whether you want to have make any final remarks or anybody wants to say, Harald, I see you unmuted. You want to say something about? No, I just wanted to thank you. You have been doing great uh, moving forward this, this panel. So ah, just thank okay. you for your, for, for, organizing this yeah uh, yeah yeah cool 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 so, so just one more <laughs> thing i right. have to say right i mean and this is like i mean and this is for the next year right it's next because we have one minute so we have we were talking about cxl here and but we did not mention c6 we did not mention open KP, we did not mention other protocols that are out there so and i'm not saying which one is better but it's it's definitely there is a lot of effort there in in really connecting these devices so and so that's it. Cool. I mean, thanks. I mean, this is all for me. I'm come, I'm giving back the mic to to the organizers. Thanks for 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 organizing this workshop. It was nice listening your your talks, all of you. I'm coming. I'm more on the hardware side, so this was well, this was refreshing for me. And uh, and that's it. Keep doing so. Thank you. Yeah, Bye -bye. you are on the dark side, Peter. You are yeah, on the dark I, side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much folks for, for presenting your very interesting work on our workshop. It's been a pleasure to, to listening and learning from, from, your, from, from your studies. So let's keep the good work. Uh, let's hope we can meet next year, possibly face to face rather than virtually. So I don't know if Joao or Tony wants to add something else, but otherwise let's call it a day. No? Good. Thank, Thank you, you so much, folks. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.